Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I will call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order, November 14th, 2022. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. We will start our meeting as we always do. If you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for everybody who's watching online and on TV tonight. Uh, Council, it's, it seems like it's been a while. Our last meeting was October 24th, and I realized today, the last time we met, it was summer. And here it is now. We are fully into winter. So uh, it's amazing how time flies. So it's good to see everybody back together again. Our first item this evening is to approve tonight's agenda, and it is what we like to call a beefy agenda. There's a lot going on tonight. Uh, under our introductory items, we have an introduction to new employees, proclamation regarding Small Business Saturday, a presentation from our folks at the Bloomington Leadership Program, uh, a report on some communications awards that our, our communication staff won, and then an update on our supplier diversity assessment. Under our consent business, Councilmember Nelson has our consent business, and there are 29 items on the consent calendar tonight. Uh, Councilmember uh, Nelson, as I said, has that. And under our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we actually have 10 public hearings as well. We've got a uh, public hearing, uh, an ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates, uh, an ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees, refuse uh, change to stormwater charges, our 2023 utility fund budgets, the 2022 fees and charges schedule, which will include a public comment opportunity. That's item 4.5. Item 4.6 is a hearing to uh, rename the public, a public street of Picture Drive to Harmony Lane. We will have a public hearing to approve the feasibility study and order the pavement management program. Our 4.8 is the tax increment and financing discussion for Oxborough Heights development project. 4.9 is a public hearing regarding the, uh, the issuance of multifamily housing revenue notes for uh, Oxborough Heights. And 4.10 is regarding the vacation of public drainage utility and access easements. Those are our public hearings this evening. And then under organizational business, we have an item, uh, an update on Expo 2027. We'll be hearing from uh, Mr. Verbrugge and from David Lair. From, uh, he's a senior advisor to Minnesota USA Expo. We'll be talking about transitional industrial zoning district and resolution to initiate rezoning. And finally, item 5.3, our city council policy and issue update. Just based on how long it took me to read that and go through all of that, uh, I am going to ask council uh, that we keep our questions on point and our comments uh, we're, we're judicious with our comments. We've got a lot to go through. I would ask the same of staff that we want to make sure that we get through everything and then we're not all here until the sun comes up because it's, uh, it comes up late in the, in the morning the, now <laughs> this time of year. Council, is there anything to add or any changes to our agenda this evening? Hearing none, I would move tonight's agenda and look for a second. Second. Got a motion and a second by Councilmember Coulter to accept tonight's agenda. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with Councilmember Lohman. I think he's probably stuck in traffic on his way here. That's my assumption. We will move on. Now that we have an agenda, we will move on to our introductory items. And item 2.1 is the introduction of new employees. And we actually have a number of new employees that we're going to be introducing this evening. And I'm just going to go down the list that they are here in the, uh, in the council packet. We're going to start with the, uh, the police department. I think we've got two new members of the police department. Chief Booker Hodges is going to welcome and introduce, it uh, looks like Amanda Howard and Alyssa Nordby. Chief. How you doing? Very well. How are you this evening? Good. Uh, so we got two new employees today. Uh, we stole one from uh, Richfield and one from the country of Australia. So I'll let um, <laughs> Amanda start off first um, and then Alyssa. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, thank you very much for having me. My name's Amanda Howard, I am from Australia, so it's coming up to two years that I've been in the US, but only in Minnesota since uh, May of this year. So we are all enjoying our first big snow day today, the kids especially, and the dog. Um, I come to you from Australia with operational law enforcement experience and criminal intelligence analysis experience and some defence and security management experience. I'm very, very happy to be working back in law enforcement again with the Bloomington Police Department and supporting them in my admin role in anything that they need. Very good. Welcome. Thank you. 
Hello. Um, my name's Elisa Nordby, and I recently came from Richfield. Um, I worked at the police department there for um, for about two years, and then prior to that, I was with the city of Maple Grove um, for about 15 years, working for their police department. Um, Mr. Verbrugge, um, this is actually not our first time our paths have crossed. My first job was um, in the summer of 1999 with the city of Egan working at Cascade Bay Water Park. And I knew that you also worked there because my mom worked with you. <laughs> um, and so when I told her I got this job, she was very excited. And I'm also really excited to be here. Um, I think the Bloomington Police Department and the city of Bloomington have a really good reputation and I'm just honored to be part of the team. Thank you. Thank you, we're happy to have you, welcome. Chief Hodges, congratulations, you win the award for this week for recruiting the staff member from the farthest away. Well done. It's, uh... Next up, we have uh, one new staff member in our community development department. Our director of community development, Carla Henderson, will make the introduction. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, Chief, hold my beer. Um, I'd like to introduce <laughs> uh, Kaba, and I'm going to get this right, sir. Yeah. Nangoti? Nangato. Nangato, thank you. Um, who joined us on October 24th uh, as a program specialist to in our HRA. He comes from the baking. Well, oh yes, well, <laughs> Gambia. So I think a little bit further than, um, uh, uh, and that's where he grew up. Uh, and he, but he joins us from the private banking sector, where he was an underwriter and um, worked on mortgages. And he will be leading our home buyer and homeowners lending programs. And in his spare time, he likes to play Scrabble soccer, read books, and play with his seven-year-old son. So, Cabo? <laughs> Thank you, yes. I like you said, I am Cabo Nyangaro. Um, I came to this country as an international student about two decades ago from this small country of the Gambia, West Africa. Um, I have worked in mortgage underwriting and compliance management. I went to University of St. Thomas and Minnesota State University, Mankato. I'm excited to join the Department of Community Development in the city of Bloomington, and I'm looking forward to the challenge, and I'm all excited and pumped up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's a close second for the for, for furthest. We have a new uh, staff member from Community Services. Who's going to make that introduction? or not. I will be happy to. Um, Alfia Pripik? Oh, she's, she's not here? Okay. Well, okay. We, will, we, will have, we will welcome her next week. Very good. And then we move into our legal department. And we have one, two, three, four, five new members of our legal department. Ms. Manderscheid. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so tonight, um, I um, am super excited to report that we're fully staffed. Uh, right now um, for the next week. And then we're recruiting um, a new assistant city attorney, so get the word out. Um, I have five folks here tonight. Um, uh, I've asked them to each let you know um, their name, how long they've been at the city, and what they do for the city, and a one-sentence description of what they do. So in the interest of time, I will turn it over to the folks on WebEx first. I gave them the, the opportunity to be on WebEx or in person, especially given the weather. So, um, and then uh, uh, Mr. Malik is here in person. Good evening, all welcome. Jackie, you wanna go first? Sure, hi, my name is Jackie Byerman. I have been with the city of Bloomington for a little over two months now. Um, my main responsibility while working for the city is um, working for five of the criminal attorneys and assisting them with the evidentiary hearings and jury trial preparation. Welcome aboard. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Laura Pusiris.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Lorpo Cyrus. Um, I am new to the city of Bloomington. Um, I started on October 3, um, and I am the new compliance paralegal. Um, I joined the city from uh, the city of St. Paul. Uh, previously, I was there for 18 months as a criminal paralegal, uh, supporting about 20 attorneys. Um, Currently in my role, I coordinate and participate in uh, outreach and educational activities uh, for the compliance uh, division, where it's a new division. So we're laying the foundation, um, a lot of work. Um, we I assist in preparation, application and interpretation of regulations and do some investigative and uh, research and fact gathering as well. And I'm glad to be a part of the team of the city of Bloomington. Right. And we're glad to have you as part of the Bloomington team. Welcome. All thank right, uh, Liz, thank you, Laura Poo. Hi, I'm Liz Greenfield. I am an office assistant in the legal department. And I started in late July, so a little over three months. Um, my main responsibility is uh, helping to open up criminal cases and prepare the court calendars for the prosecuting attorneys. I'm happy to be here at the city. Right. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Thanks for being with us tonight. And uh, Matt, do we have do we have Kalia as well? Thank you, Liz. I don't have Kalia on the WebEx, but we have multiple uh, call-ins, so we can uh, We've got a 33% chance of picking the right <laughs> phone number here. Why don't we um, Why don't we ask Amir to come up to the uh, podium, and then we can uh, figure out if we've got Kalia on the line. Very good. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, my name is Amir Malik. Um, I was hired to uh, head the new compliance division. Um, my duties involved setting up a compliance for the recently passed Earn Sick and Safe Leave Ordinance, the Oper Opportunity Housing Ordinance, Business Subsidies, and the Conversion Therapy Ban. So I come from the city of Minneapolis most recently, and I'm excited about the opportunity. Welcome. Thanks for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Um, I'll just, uh, do we have Kalia? Well, I've, unmounted, I've unmuted our three uh, callers in. Uh, Kalia, are you one of them? All right, we'll get Kalia back another time. Very Kalia good. is um, the counterpart to um, Liz uh, Greenfield's position and that she's at the front counter. She opens cases and assists with uh, preparing the calendar for the criminal team uh, appearances in court. So... Um, they both share that position in a part-time capacity. Very good. Well, welcome to all of our new employees. Thank you for, thank you for being with us tonight, or thanks for joining in uh, via, via WebEx, and looking forward to meeting you all and, and working with you more in the future. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Next up on our agenda is item 2.2. It's a proclamation for Small Business Saturday, so I'm going to head down to the podium. Every single time. Every single time. Well, typically and traditionally, the last Saturday in November is recognized as National Small Business Saturday. Uh, it's an American holiday held the Saturday after Thanksgiving during obviously one of the busiest shopping days of the year. And this year's Small Business Saturday will be Saturday, November 26th. We have a proclamation recognizing it uh, that day this year. And also we have some of our Bloomington small business owners here with us today. So I'd like to invite up uh, a, a couple of folks here, uh, Irene Zhang and Sam Hernandez. Uh, Irene is from Midnight Toast and Sam is from Fitzo. So thank you for joining me up here tonight and we'll have, your, have an opportunity to, to say something here in just a moment. But I first will read the proclamation for a small business Saturday, November 26, 2022. Whereas Bloomington celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to the local economy and community. According to the United States Census, there are more than 38,000 small businesses 
with under 100 employees in Hennepin County, representing over 96% of all firms with paid employees in Hennepin County. And whereas, according to the United States Small Business Administration, small businesses continue to rebound from the economic recession brought on by COVID-19. In the six quarters following the recession, small businesses have rapidly added nearly 5.6 million jobs nationally. And over the past 25 years, small businesses have accounted for two-thirds of the nation's employment growth. And whereas, for many local residents, the Thanksgiving holiday kicks off a season of gathering, dining, shopping, and experiencing arts and culture, and consumers know that supporting small, independently owned businesses have positive social, economic, and environmental impacts. And whereas, Bloomington has partnered with Hennepin County to launch the Love Local campaign, which encourages residents to support local businesses that create jobs, boost the local economy, and make our communities vibrant and livable. And whereas, the SBA, as well as advocacy groups and other public and private organizations across Hennepin County have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim Saturday, November 26, 2022, as Small Business Saturday in the city of Bloomington, Minnesota, and I urge the residents of our community to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year, dated this 14th day of November 2022. Now, I mentioned the Love Local campaign. You need to, as you go out, look for these in the windows of businesses, small businesses in Bloomington. They will have these posted. And uh, if, you, uh, if you see this, please patronize the, that local business because they are a local small business in Bloomington that needs your help just to, uh, to, to continue the work that they do every day. They need, they need you to support them. Uh, obviously, there, there's a lot of shopping opportunities in Bloomington, but I hope you really do consider our Love Local campaign and the businesses that support it. For uh, businesses out there who want one of these stickers, uh, we will have city staff members distributing them through the over the next couple of weeks. And also, uh, you can pick them up here at City Plaza uh, if you ask at the front desk. I know we've got a bunch of these just waiting for folks to, to pick up and to, uh, to use. So um, I want to turn this over to two of our small business owners, uh, Irene and Sam. Thank you much for being here with us this evening. I offered you both the opportunity at the microphone, so I'm going to turn it over to either one of you. So please step on up. Please. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name's Irene Zhang, and I am a senior currently attending Jefferson High School, and I'm here representing Midnight Toast, which is a home bakery that I own and operate with my sister. So I would like to use this opportunity to express first and utmost my uh, gratitude for being part of the small business community in Bloomington, as well as on the small business development committee with Barb, as well as many other committee members in this room. And... Um, Therefore, I also want to thank my sister for paving the path that we are on today and having the success that we built together, and as well as my family for supporting me along the way. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sammy. I'm the owner and founder of Fitso. Fitso is a plus-size activewear brand, and I created this brand because I truly felt that there uh, can be a lot of improvement for the plus size experience and the plus size community all over. Um, specifically in Bloomington, I hope to bring a lot more options for plus size people through clothing. Um, and I also hope to provide um, or create more fat acceptance um, in the plus size community and just in general. I think that um, one of the first steps towards basic uh, human acceptance and fat acceptance at that is by providing basic necessities like clothing. So by providing more options, I hope to um, meet a lot of our plus size community's needs. I also just wanna say thank you to Mr. Mayor and the council as well for inviting uh, me here. I think this is a great opportunity to introduce this business and also say that we love Bloomington. Thank you.
Next up on our agenda is a presentation by a group of folks who have spent the last eight weeks, 10 weeks? Nine weeks, I was right in, okay, I missed it by on either side, uh, as part of our Bloomington Leadership Program. And I'm not going to steal any thunder as to what the program is and what these folks have done. I'm just going to turn it over to them and say welcome and thank you so very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Bussey, council members. I am so excited to be talking with you tonight about the Bloomington Leadership Program. My name is Tony Comer, and uh, I grew up in Bloomington. For those of you who don't know me, maybe some of you met, I met in the program. It's good to see your faces again. Uh, I grew up in Bloomington, moved away when I was in middle school, and uh, kind of journeyed around southern Minnesota, spent some time at Minnesota State Mankato. I'm proud that I'm not the only maverick in the room tonight. Uh, and uh, I moved back to Bloomington and always considered Bloomington to be home, really. Uh, I moved back during mid-COVID, what I like to call mid-COVID, in January of 2021. And I felt like probably a lot of younger people, I wanted to get involved in my community and community engagement. But I didn't really know where to begin. I've always been kind of interested in local politics and wanting to get involved in having some kind of impact, but didn't really know where to start, didn't really have resources, and it was always kind of intimidating to me. Well, enter the Bloomington Leadership Program. I heard about it actually from a previous graduate, a guy you might know by the name of Matt Dimmick. He told me to join, and I thought, you know, I think I'm going to try out for this. And what do you know? They, they, they accepted me to the program. So uh, I really benefited from this program, the nine weeks that we spent together. Uh, I think I have three main takeaways that I kind of wanted to share. I was a leader with confidence, competence, and community. Uh, I was able to grow in confidence, really step up and learn how I can kind of fit in and use my gifts, my talents, my resources to better my community. I was competent or well-informed. I learned about the inner workings of Bloomington, like the water treatment plant, uh, what are boards and commissions, uh, how can you serve in one of perhaps the nonprofits like the Oasis for Youth. I, I kind of call it a choose-your-own-adventure book for anywhere you could go next in the city of Bloomington. You can kind of find something that's right up your alley and go and plug right in. And also community. Uh, there are several other people who participated in the program, and we just really bonded and actually became really good friends as a result of learning together and having that common interest. We were constantly laughing, having fun together, and we were learning how to be better leaders and better participants in our community, better citizens. So that was just very powerful for me. Uh, I know for me, I really want to get involved in the Sustainability Commission, be part of efforts to help the environment, help in our city, and uh, I'm very interested in the boards and commissions being a part of what the city has going on. And so it's really neat to think that a few weeks ago, a few short weeks ago, I went from being someone who I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to fit in, kind of want to get involved, but time is limited and where do I even really start to now I could answer both of those questions. I know I can, what I can give my time to. And this program really provided an avenue for getting involved and knowing where to plug in. So at this time, I would also like to introduce Priscilla to speak next. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Well, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, city manager, and thank you so much for allowing me to share my personal experience of the Bloomington Leadership Program. My name is Priscilla Roberts, and I am, am been a member, uh, or I'm a Bloomington resident for about eight years now. So I first heard about the Bloomington Leadership Program a few years ago when I attended an evening diversity workshop hosted by Faith Jackson. The facilitator for our group was a graduate of the BLP, and she spoke very highly of her positive experience. Then last year, around this time, I had the honor to partake in an amazing process of the Bloomington Strategic Plan on the core planning team. Now, this experience was life-changing for me, and I wanted to learn more about the city, its government, and the inner workings, so to speak, of the departments 
all of which the leadership program has delivered. As I reflect back, I do have a few key points that kept me and still is keeping me motivated and energized. The first one is I believe that interaction and participation creates connections. Prior to the first meeting, uh, we received an invitation to complete an insights discovery personal profile. Now being unfamiliar with this type of assessment, I was not sure on how this was going to be uh, contribute to the leadership program. A little apprehensive, just a little bit. However, at our first meeting, we discussed our results with one another, and it began, it began to make sense. Then we moved on to a team interactive exercise as we participated in the Insights Discovery Team Will. This process introduced me to diverse personalities, similar colors to me, other colors different, but I do believe that that exercise represented the strength of connection for me and within the team itself. Second, I had the opportunity uh, to look inside the city vault, if you will. I was introduced to the governmental structure of the city, met with representatives from each of the departments, the interaction and the participation from the mayor, council members, city manager, police and fire, and the like at our sessions secured the concept of connection for me because I learned that most of the representatives had participated in the very same insight, discovery, personal profile, and team will. So they walked in our shoes, so to speak, and that brought connection to me. And last, I would say that equal standing, there was an equal standing that was part of our uh, rules, so to speak, and regulation each and every week that was read. And I liked equal standing. This belief really did it for me. Because as I stand before you this evening, I have no idea from our cohort who is a director, who is a senior manager, if there's a CEO. And that's because the focus of the leadership program was not on job title. The program gave us and me the liberty to have a voice, to have our voices be heard and respected. And I believe that that sincere value of the BLP is what I truly appreciate the most. BLT has encouraged me to be proactive and get involved in inclusive community efforts um, for Bloomington residents and perhaps assist with uh, future recruitment efforts to diversify the city of Bloomington departments and staff. Thank you to my cohort, who I can now call friends and mentors, and thank you to Amanda and Emily for doing such an amazing job. And with that, I will pass it on to Julie. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, Priscilla. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Um, <clears throat> My name is Julie Gustafson. I am a current or recent graduate of the BLP, Bloomington Leadership Program. I just wanted to first start with expressing my deepest gratitude and saying thank you for hosting this um, annually. This is a great program and I really, really must say, I had moments where I truly felt like Dorothy Gale and I got to see the great and powerful Oz that is the city of Bloomington. And you know, I will say, I certainly had no idea that there are so many moving parts and active bodies to functioning a city. <clears throat> so, a little bit about me, Q Journey, everyone. I am your hometown girl. I went to school here. I made friends here. I work here. And I've continued to cultivate a life here. Um, when I saw the opportunity to partake in the Bloomington Leadership Program, I thought this is an opportunity that I would be a fool to pass up. So I wanted to give back to the community that has given me so much in turn. Um, as someone who's lived here for, we'll say, at least 18 years, um, I just was surprised with how uninformed I was as a citizen. I had little understanding to um, what it means to, you know, be a charter city, um, where cities get funding, and um, who makes decisions. 
So in the nine weeks of this program, my biggest takeaway is I made friends. I found like minds. I was amongst kindred spirits. In eight weeks, I became not only informed, but completely inspired by my community. To me, the city of Bloomington is ripe with potential, and I got wildly inspired to want to be a part of that potential. Knowing that I too can have an active voice in the community by way of volunteerism, activism, coming to a city council meeting, um, joining boards or commissions. The um, Bloomington Leadership Program is an invaluable experience, and I can't wait to go onward and do good in my community as a part of it. Um, at this time, I would like to, we would like to open up to questions that you guys may have for us. Also, do we have any questions of our graduates of the Bloomington Leadership Program? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, folks. Nice Good to evening. see you. I think I saw most of you at the, yeah. uh, I was a mem had a pleasure of being part of the mock city council meeting. Yeah. yeah. That was a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite night. <laughs> oh, great. Good to hear. Remember that, everybody. I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what, what, if you could articulate for us, what was like the most surprising thing? Not necessarily negative or versus positive or anything. But Can just I just tell thing you? That, pardon me? The, the ORT chart. <laughs> Knowing that uh, Jamie is at the center of the, all the madness. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the question was, what was the most surprising part? Yeah. Being able to experience, so I mentioned the mock council meeting. Uh, there was a night where we were all, uh, Amanda and Emily assigned us different roles, <laughs> and a couple of us got to be uh, council members, and I was one of the people who was a mock <laughs> council member, and I was not on a power trip, I promise you. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I did not let it get to my head. But uh, it was just interesting to see all of the different dynamics that go into running a council meeting, making informed, thoughtful decisions, uh, learning things about city services like the uh, police department and the uh, fire department, all the different resources that are needed versus the resources that we have at disposal, even in a larger city like Bloomington, the fact that uh, we have a, um, even though we're transitioning a volunteer fire, um, fire department, uh, this is not a pat myself on the back type thing, but now whenever I see someone who's wearing a firefighter uniform, I always try and say thank you. I go out of my way to say thank you because you realize how much effort everybody puts into these jobs as a volunteer basis sometimes. So just seeing and experiencing the full scope of everything was truly surprising to me. I'd say the, pretty much the same thing as that. That was... Um, one of my most favorite sessions as well is to kind of learn the inner workings and um, how it really functions and fits together. I know that the city of Bloomington itself has different partnerships, Bloomington schools and things like that, but um, just being able to kind of be on the inside and the other side of things to see how it all fits together. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I was very sad to miss the Mock City Council night this year. I did do it in previous years. I think I was the mayor once, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty fun. Pressure. Um, so I don't want to totally put you on the spot, but I guess my question would be, um, you know, do you see any opportunities for us to enhance the program or improve the program? I mean, I, I really, really appreciate the fact that you were willing to spend so much time um, participating in this this effort and honestly it, I sit up here and like just listening to each of you speak it's so inspiring and it makes me just like feel so happy I'm like good oh, yes because um, I love that you all had such a great experience and so I guess I'm just curious so are there opportunities for us to enhance it or change it um, in your opinion I think my chief argument for that would be make it longer I I feel like in the time frame that we were involved, you know, we were scratching the surface and like that whole thing of like being comfortable with your peers takes a little time and then 
being comfortable with opening up and talking about what you feel is going on and what could be room for improvement, things like that. You know, it just takes time to cultivate that bond. Although our cohort was pretty quick with bonding with each other pretty regularly. Um, I think you could easily expand by at least maybe four more weeks, make it 12 weeks and you might see even more outstanding results from your, your, you know, city folk. Um, I also want to address that question, Council Member Carter. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to say I don't want to take it for granted that the city does this. Some cities don't make this investment to even have a leadership program. So, again, I also want to thank Amanda and Emily for actually doing this before we could say anything to enhance it. It's easy to take that for granted itself. Uh, I would also agree on the length, like uh, I think that was kind of a consistent theme in our last meeting because we also kind of went over ways that we could maybe kind of improve the program. And uh, I, I want to say just because I'm such a social person, it's a nice idea to have more time to gather that community piece that I talked about and get to know your community. Uh, but uh, I would say... Absolutely. I, I'm one of those people that would want to maybe have a couple more sessions where we could dive in deeper. And maybe not everyone would say that um, if we're already in the percentage of people that give up their Thursday night to learn about local government that might say something about how committed, albeit crazy, we are about it. But uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, make the program longer. It's, it, I, I would want more, not less. I would go for maybe two more sessions, my, you know, I mean, that's just my personal um, input there. But to enhance it, it would be um, useful, I think, to sort of have more follow-up um, from the city um, and um, come together on, like, a social event. Maybe we have something at the farmer's market or over Fourth of July, and you can call alumni back, yeah. you know, and so all the alumni, we have a little spotlight up there before the band starts playing or something. And to really get the word out there. Um, if, if you weren't connected, you may not have known about the actual leadership program in one way or another, but to sort of just advertise it a little bit more. Uh, the structure itself, I think, is phenomenal I, and fair, you know, how you apply and you commit to certain numbers of sessions. And if you don't do that, then you're pretty much asked to vacate the program. So I think the inner workings of it is, is perfect. But I would just say to sort of get the word out a little bit more advertised. The flyer didn't you know, does justice or whatever. There's a let's talk Bloomington, you know, just kind of those sorts of things. And I'm sure I can't speak for all of us, but on our cohort, we'd be more than happy to hop in and talk about it or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. I think you're right, Priscilla. Council member Loman. More so just a comment, not really a question. Uh, you know, I just uh, want to thank you for uh, uh, taking the time uh, to, to, learn more about the city uh, or learn more about the city uh, as it as it were and uh, you know I didn't get the opportunity this time I had a little scheduling uh, kerfunkel so it's probably the first time I've missed a Bloomington learn to lead uh, which I um, found out to be uh, unfortunate but uh, I am fortunate to see the, the work that you've done here today and I, I've noticed over the years uh, just the quality of uh, folks uh, as they leave uh, the Bloomington Learn to Lead program and continue to be involved in the city. And I want to encourage you uh, to, to really do that uh, because we need you here in the city. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to watching that and seeing that uh, as, as you decide what you're going to do next uh, with this experience. So again, thank you. Um, you know, the mayor already said that to you a couple weeks ago, uh, but I just want to just personally just want to thank you for taking that time. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. And as we we had a great graduation ceremony a couple weeks back, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but I, I said then, much like Councilmember Lohman said, thank you for the time. I mean, nine weeks is not an insignificant commitment. We all have stuff going on, and, and you all, all made it the, the nine weeks every Thursday night for a number of hours. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for the learning that you did, that you are now, you, you now know what you're talking about when you talk about the city of Bloomington. Exactly. I mean, in an, right. in an age where folks become you know, uh, experts on, on issues be based on something they got emailed from them or saw on, online. You, no, you actually learned and you actually came forward with, uh, with the information or learned the information firsthand, and, and I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the leadership skills that you learned 
and look forward to having you put them to use in our city, in and, and the, the city and the community at large. There's a lot, and I know we talked about this, there's a lot of leadership opportunities within the city, within the community, and I really hope you, you, you grab it with both hands and, and run with it. So, right. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so you. Thank you to Thank all of you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item 2.4, and this is another uh, celebratory type of thing. Uh, we have some 2022 communications awards that we're going to talk about. We have our communications administrator, Janine Hill, here to tell us. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Bussey and council members. We'll get the slides up and running. I think you just put it in slideshow mode and we're ready to go. Just if you go back to um, let's see. Okay. Well, okay. Well, you get to see my notes. Wait, we get everything. to see your notes in the next okay. slide. <laughs> All right, good. Sorry for the delay. Okay, this year, uh, the city was honored with awards from the Minnesota Association of Government Communicators and the City County Communications and Marketing Association, or 3CMA. We were honored with 10 awards this year. And I want to get started and say that first up, with a first place award and a best of show nomination, one of only five entries in MAGC's, MAGC's contest to be nominated for this special honor is the 2021 State of the City. Mayor Bussey's first State of the City address since being elected and a year into the pandemic was themed 2020, a year like no other, stories of hope, challenges, and resilience. And it helped us tell the story of what the community had been through the previous year, our struggles, and how we comforted and supported each other, and how we persevered. Judges called it a home run. This was outstanding work, they said, well produced and full of great content, and an all-around entry that deserves a Best of Show nomination. They said the storytelling was very touching and added value to the presentation. The mayor did an awesome job delivering his message, too. And I should note, that the 2021 State of the City also received a first place Savvy Award from 3CMA the previous year. Discover Bloomington, a monthly show that highlights activities, the arts, local businesses, and much more, received first place honors in 3CMA, 3CMA's contest in the interview, talk show, and news programming category. Judges called it the full package. City news and information packaged in a captivating storytelling. One judge said, I believe I might have binge watched several episodes and learned a lot about your city. <laughs> this really is a great series. I found the stories well crafted and executed. Excellent work. Well written, well organized, well produced, well done. For a summary of the show, let's take a brief look at the series intro. Our great city has so much to offer. And we want to bring some of these features to you in a new cable television show, Discover Bloomington. The program will be focused on activities, amenities, the arts, local businesses, and more. City staff and community members will go behind the scenes to provide an in-depth look at some of the stories that highlight our community. So come along with us and let's Discover Bloomington together. The video series Bloomington Today, which runs on cable television and YouTube, also received first place honors from MAGC. Judges said, great approach establishing yourselves as the go-to source for city news, which can be tremendously helpful in this media climate. Well done. And another first place award went to the series Bloomington Pioneers and Changemakers. This series profiles black leaders who have a connection to Bloomington. 
The people featured in this series have worked to advance civil rights and remove barriers to equity in the fields of faith, education, law, housing, government, and more. Judges said of Bloomington pioneers and change makers, awesome job. Production was fabulous, excellent creativity. Let's take a brief look at these two video series award winners. Welcome to Bloomington Today. I'm Emily Taplin. Thanks for joining us. First, we bring you the buzz for the week of August 24th through the 30th. Dozens of Bloomington residents attended a town hall forum to learn more about their city. I'm Tim Bussey. This is our first mayor's town hall. And very glad that you're here and appreciate your, your being here and your participating. The forum took place August 17th at the Oak Grove Middle School Auditorium. It was an informal setting where questions were submitted either before or at the event, read by Fire Chief Yuli Seal and answered by Mayor Bussey. I've been at Oasis since 2014, so about seven years. Why I show up every day is to be that community leader that we know is lacking in the Bloomington community. I've often been accused of wanting to change the world. And you know, I think I found a position in which I actually can. I know what it's like to be in a hole. I know what it's like not to have anybody. So I'm gonna stand in that place for people who need it. I better leave that alone because you don't want to see me boohoo. <laughs> The briefing newsletter receives award recognition year after year, and this year was awarded second place from both MAGC and 3CMA. Judges were effusive in their praise of the briefing, saying the Bloomington communications team delivered. Bravo, a beautiful briefing with a short, easy to read format and gorgeous photos giving monthly updates to the community. They said, this briefing has made me really consider doing something similar in our community. The scope of this publication blows my mind. What many communities do on a seasonal basis, you took from bi-monthly to monthly. That's an enormous undertaking. That you are able to execute it so cleanly and clearly is a testament to your work. I really appreciate the variety of information from issue to issue, one judge said. Your community looks like a fantastic place to live. MAGC awarded a second place Silver Circle Award for the 2021 Corporate Report to the Community, the presentation of the city's financials to the community in this format and delivery has received much recognition over the years, including multiple first place awards at both the local and national levels. And a second place award from MAGC went to Bloomington Collective, Stories of Solidarity, a video series dedicated to featuring a variety of BIPOC-owned businesses in Bloomington. Our goals for the series included amplifying BIPOC-owned businesses and keeping with the City Council's strategic priority of equity and inclusion, introducing the greater community to businesses they potentially never heard of before, and providing a feature story in video format that could be shared to promote their businesses via social media, website, or email. The weekly council minute message from Mayor Bussey received a third place award from MAGC. In this under 10 minute video, which viewers can see on cable TV, YouTube, and Facebook, Mayor Bussey provides a recap of important agenda items and news happening in Bloomington. And finally, the revamped employee newsletter, The Insider, was awarded a third place national award from 3CMA. In the last year, The Insider transformed from a monthly print publication to a weekly electronic news format. An important job in communications is to keep employees informed of what's going on in the city and with their coworkers so they can provide continued high quality service to the community and important information. Judges said, way to go with the surveys that were sent to employees. The quantitative results and the qualitative feedback shows the insider is a valued communications piece among employees. The return on weekly staff investment is high. Mayor and Council, that rounds out the awards from this year. These awards are competitive. This, this year, 3CMA received 642 entries from cities and counties across the country who were hoping to place in this year's awards contest. 
Maintaining high standards and producing quality work continues to show the City of Bloomington organization is committed to delivering engaging, transparent, and timely communications to the community. There are many, many, many staff from around the city who make these awards possible by providing content, ideas, support, and leadership. We are grateful to residents and business owners who provide us with feedback and compliments and also to hear from them that they are staying informed on what's happening in Bloomington because of the work we do. Thank you, Mayor and Council members, for allowing me to present to you tonight. Well, thank you for leading this effort and for the outstanding work that the communications team does. I, I, I can't say enough about the quality of work that comes out of, out of that department. The, I mean, you, you mentioned engagement, timely and transparent. I, yes, yes, and yes, and in so many different ways, and in video and in print, and, uh, and with our engagement efforts out in the community, just, it, it's just such a wonderful uh, effort that comes forward each, each month, literally each month, uh, from the from the communication staff, so uh, my hats off to you. It's uh, I, we've all seen plenty of communications vehicles from a lot of different organizations, from public sector organizations, from private sector, and I can honestly say I can't think of a more comprehensive or better approach than what we take here with our communications department here in the city of Bloomington. I, I, hats off to you. Well, well done. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And please share our thanks and congratulations to the entire staff. I will. Good. Thank you. Thank you. And our final item under our introductory items in the agenda tonight is an update on our supplier diversity assessment. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I am Dana Chow. I'm the purchasing agent for the city, and I'm here tonight to provide you guys with an update on the supplier diversity assessment. Um, as you may recall, we came before you uh, in the spring to request some strategic priorities money to be used to fund a assessment into developing a supplier diversity program, and I'm here to give you the high-level results of that assessment. <laughs> Okay, well, I can kind of keep going while they figure that out. Um, so in doing this, uh, in developing a supplier diversity program, we were really looking for our path to be driven by uh, city staff and outside supplier input. So we engaged with 109 staff members and 82 vendors. Staff members were provided seven opportunities to engage and one staff survey. This went out to every single staff member and I'm happy to say that we had great turnout. Um, every department was represented. Uh, most people who participated in any type of purchasing did show up and participate in a session. The main takeaways from the session were a overall desire for, centralized, for a centralized database where people would be able to access uh, small and local businesses. So there is definitely a call from um, employees to have this program. Uh, okay, you can keep going. Okay, uh, so this started out with an idea. We did some research, final policy and proposal. We have been now provided a 97 page um, proposal that outlines step by step exactly what we would need to do to put in a small business program. This will not be a small or quick undertaking. Uh, we are now at the point of deciding uh, what our immediate steps are going to be, uh, what the timeline is for those, and what resources will be necessary to implement that. In the immediate, immediate future, what you can expect to see from us will be a new How to Do Business with Bloomington guide that will be available to anyone looking to do business with the city. Uh, we will also be looking to engage in forecasting with department leaders um, and provide a list twice a year to the community of what goods and services we anticipate purchasing so people can be aware of if they provide things that we may be looking for in the future. And the feasibility um, of developing a prompt payment policy for small businesses are some of the lower hanging fruit that we will be immediately pursuing. That's it. Well, thank you. That was a, a quick distillation of a 95-page report. <laughs> that well done. I appreciate that. Um, uh, council questions, comments, 
Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just briefly, I'm curious going forward, um, and it sounds like obviously more planning to do on implementation, but are there any early plans to solicit feedback from some of these new suppliers that may be engaging with us for the first time? So what's the impact of a prompt payment so policy? That would be, um, in order to do that, we need to develop a supplier database. Right now, we don't have the data of who we're doing business with. Okay. Um, we do on a very high level, but not on that micro level of who is a small business, who is a minority business, a woman-owned business, a veteran-owned business. We don't have that kind of detail. Okay. Um, we can tell you who we give 1099s to, and that's about it. So uh, rolling back many steps, the first will be the development of a supplier database that tracks that kind of data and interfaces with our existing systems. Okay. So that will be some of the resources needed. Awesome. To Thanks for your work. I'm, I'm excited to see that come forward. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I appreciate your first in the immediate to do is the immediate low, low hanging fruit, the some sort of publication of how to do business with the city. And frankly, I'm kind of surprised there isn't something already. And was that something you heard specifically from businesses that uh, just to have something close at hand would be very helpful to them? We didn't hear specifically from them that that would be um, more so we don't, when people email me and ask, well, how do I find out about this? I email back and say, well, put your name in the e-subscribe and mm -hmm. we'll send you something. That's it. It, it, it can, there's definitely been room for improvement. Uh, we've just been waiting to complete this process before we roll out the next thing. So yeah, we're looking at putting together a comprehensive plan, perhaps with um, some sort of vendor open houses that would integrate with the forecasting so that uh, departments would present to the suppliers how to do business, what we're looking at doing, um, and then have more of a small and local business kind of fair uh, for vendors to get a start at doing business here. That sounds like a great approach. Good, good call on that. Council, anything additional? Very good. Thank you Thank much you. for the update. Appreciate it. Moving on, we will go to item three on our agenda, our consent business. Councilmember Nelson has a big consent agenda in front of him. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I will try to make quick work of it. We'll just <laughs> go one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so I I have not heard of any uh, holds. City manager um, had indicated that there weren't any. Did anybody want to hold anything? All right. With that, I will move approval of all of the consent agenda items. Second. Motion by Councilmember Nelson, second by Councilmember Martin to accept tonight's consent agenda as listed in the uh, the council packet. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Well done. <laughs> 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 Item four on the agenda is our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances section of the agenda. And up first is item 4.1, which is our first public hearing of the evening. It's a uh, public hearing regarding an ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates. Kari Carlson, our budget manager, will be presenting this and actually I think the next few items on our agenda this evening. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. While we are bringing up the slides, I'll just get started. Um, so at, as a reminder, at the October 17th Council meeting, I presented these 2023 proposed utility rates and corresponding utility fund budgets uh, with the help of Utility Superintendent Scott Anderson, who is also in the council chambers, uh, Water Resources Manager Brian Greedle, that is online, and Public Works Project Coordinator Laura Horner, that is also online this evening, if there are any additional questions. And then um, ahead of the public hearing for the 2023 utility rates, I have this presentation, and I just want to highlight very quickly some of this key information that was presented and discussed already on October 17th. So I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly um, and go to the, oh, I can do this. So before we get into um, the budgets, I just wanted to take a moment just to talk about the working capital. Is this going automatically? Um, go back one. So the working capital, um, we use that, we forecast in the, the long-term long effects. Um, 
that it will have on the and it's the current assets less the current liabilities. And um, basically, what it is, it's the cash reserve in the fund, and um, the current assets are the cash or other very liquid assets, and the current liabilities are typically outstanding bills that meet, uh, need to be paid soon to vendors. So the easiest way to think about it is that it's the cash that's available, and these funds all have working capital or cash reserve goals based on their future capital needs. Okay, so getting into the water fund. This fund accounts for the costs related to the operation, maintenance, and renewal of the water system, and this utility strives to meet or exceed federal and state quality standards at an affordable rate that ensures the long-term sustainability of the overall water system. And uh, this graph that um, Scott had shared with you, um, just wanted to point out one of the key drivers of the water rates, it's not just the operation and maintenance, but the future asset renewal. And so uh, the water, need, water rates need to generate enough revenue to build reserves for repairs and replacements of the infrastructure. And this is the graph that just shows that if we were to replace all the water infrastructure assets based on their strict end of life estimation, that's the blue line, we would have some significant spikes in spending. Um, but what we do is uh, use the orange line that it doesn't have the significant spikes. And that um, is how we budget for um, water infrastructure replacement um, by using asset management tools to take in the uh, account of the actual condition of the assets. Here's the comparison chart. This is uh, the graph that has water rates. This is based on using 6,000 gallons of water per month. So this just demonstrates, uh, this is for softened water, that Bloomington continues to provide softened water at a relatively low cost to other cities. So those blue bars represent the softened water, and then the red bars would be unsoftened water. And so then that white bar like difference represents if you, the home softened water for those cities that don't already have softened water. So by comparison for softened water, uh, Bloomington in this chart has a uh, second to the lowest softened water rate. Here is what the increases have been over the last uh, five years. So 9.5%, 9%, 8.5%. Um, in 2021, we were trying very hard um, during the pandemic to keep it as low as possible, so only 3%. And then same with 22, a uh, lower at 5%. And so what's proposed for 2023 is a 7.5% increase. And this is a few of the years of the bigger long-term model for the water utility fund. Uh, we're projecting revenues of just under $21.4 million and, um, for the 2023 budget. And proposed expenses um, around 20.4 million, and that includes upcoming capital water projects of three million dollars. And in the next several years, we'll have um, we have projections of spending three million to eight million dollars per year for infrastructure projects. And then again, just to highlight that we are using some American Rescue Plan funds that helped out this overall funds working capital balance. So that is what I have on the water fund. I'll just pause to see if there's any comments or questions. We also have Scott Anderson here. Council, comments, questions regarding the water fund? Council Member Lohman. So we've talked about this at length before, but for those folks who, who are not, you know, are just tuning into this for the first time uh, tonight, really what my question is, uh, so if we weren't to, to, to pass this, um, uh, this increase, uh, on, uh, there would be, you know, as we're looking here, an impact uh, to the future uh, years. And so I just wanted to just, uh, uh, maybe it's more of a comment now as I, <laughs> as I move my way through this question, but uh, I wanted to just throw out, you know, what the impacts would be if we were to not uh, do that increase. Uh, and I think it's pretty obvious. You can see here what that, that put us in a, in, a, in a different position when you come to the out years that are, that are coming up. So I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that, but I just want to 
just bring that forward because I think one of the questions that I oftentimes get is, well, you know, everything seems to be increasing. Uh, you know, is there a way we could, you know, just not increase this one item? So. Yes, Ms. thank Council. you, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Loman. Uh, that is correct. Um, if we don't have this increase in the rates, it would negatively affect uh, the working capital balance in this fund and um, affect our ability to be able to do future infrastructure uh, replacements in the water fund. Council, additional questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. How are you, Carrie? Good. <clears throat> so, Carrie, um, I don't know if this is a question for you or for someone else, but the the um, can you go back to the actual rate changes? Perfect. Thank you. So, so the um, you mentioned that the rates on the slide where you compared to cities was based on six thousand gallons. Is that right? And then we have the tier one rate for twelve thousand gallons and the tier two rate for t over twelve thousand gallons. I I'm kind of curious how how we make the determination about the the thresholds for tier one versus tier two. And I ask that question because I've received a number of questions from residents about um, you know who are member have larger households right especially in, in like intergenerational families where there might be nine people in the household and everything and that um, you know the the likelihood that they'll go into that tier two rate is higher right when you have more people living in a residence and so I'm just trying to understand you know is there is there like, like what's the data or what's the you know the circumstances behind the the tiering sure thank you uh, Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, <clears throat> the 6,000 gallon per month threshold for the comparison purposes was based on um, our average user, average annual household uses about 4,4200 gallons per month. And so we wanted to try to capture, um, it, capture that tier two use by, by comparing a larger quantity than, than the average user recognizing that that there are larger families and, and larger users. Um, so that's that's where the 6,000 came from. Sure. And the, and the tier one to tier two threshold of 12,000 gallons, where does that come from? So the, the tier, so that threshold has, you know, that's, that's been adjusted over time uh, when that tier system was put into place based on that, the average user and and I think we talked about this a little bit back in October in terms of um, tier two usage for different customers and so looking at that usage trying to to set that tier at a spot where it encourages conservation that's the intent of of the statute and the intent of of what that tier is is trying to do while not burdening um, larger families and and still providing um, outdoor and recreation and non-essential uses in that tier one pricing. Yeah. Okay. Final question. <clears throat> you mentioned for about 40, 40,420 or so, yeah, 40, give or take, 40, we'll just go 4,500. Yeah. That's cool. <clears throat> so 4,500 gallons is the average household. Do you know the, I, I'm assuming that we can use like the 2.4 number of like the average number of people in a house then as our, as our monic Okay. Um, so what you're saying is that 12,000 gallons is three times the average use of a family of, of a typical household in Bloomington that has about two and a half people in it. Is so that the, the 12,000 gallons is your bi-monthly average. The 4,200 is a monthly number. So, um, 9,000 gallons bi monthly for your single family okay, so versus the 12,000 of the tier one. So it leaves that little bit of, like I said, a little bit of cushion for that non-essential use potentially in the summer or for larger, larger users to still take advantage of that tier one pricing before they bump into tier two. Right. Okay. Um, I'll reserve the rest of my comments for later, but um, it's an area of, of, of opportunity, I think, for us to look at that. I'm not exactly sure if that 2.4 person household thing is a good you know is it necessarily a good average maybe we need something more median oriented or something that would help some of our larger families especially since we know you know that's um, a scenario in, in many of our immigrant communities so thank you for the information I really appreciate it You're welcome. council additional questions so 
So, Kari, let me ask you, are we going to go through the entire presentation and then hold the individual uh, public hearings, or did you want to do them after each bit of the presentation? I was planning to go through the whole presentation. Go ahead. Okay, that sounds works? good to me. Okay. Um, so, go to the next slide. All right, so we'll go into the wastewater fund. And this fund accounts for the sewer collection system and the treatment charges from the Metropolitan Council. And so the objective of this utility is to provide sanitary service, capacity, and sufficient maintenance to minimize system blockages. So historically, the Met Council sewage disposal costs that we pay them has accounted for about 60% of the total expenses for this fund. So we also have a graph for the wastewater utility asset outlook. It's um, not quite as, doesn't vary as much as the water, um, but shows have, have a more um, uh, standard plan for uh, replacing assets. And here's the comparison for the 2022 residential water rates. I circled Bloomington in red on this slide. Uh, so we are uh, towards the lower compared to several of our peer cities. Um, here is the history of the wastewater rate increases. Um, we don't see as much volatility in the wastewater fund as we do in the water fund. The water fund um, really gets impacted based on weather. So if we have very wet years, we don't have as much water revenue. Uh, wastewater is a bit more consistent. Um, but we've had 9% in 2018, 4%. 3.5%, we were able to keep it flat for 21, and that again was uh, during the pandemic when we were doing that budget, and then at 3% last year. And so the proposed rate for 23 is also uh, 3%, is what we're recommending. And then this is the long-term budget model for the wastewater fund. Um, it is uh, more consistent. So you can see um, healthy, healthier working capital balance. Uh, we have proposed revenues of and expenses uh, just around $14 million, and that does include $1.7 million for capital projects. And as I said, the largest expense in this fund are those fees paid to the Met Council. So that's, uh, they've given us a number of $8.2 million for 2023. Any questions on the wastewater fund? Council, questions on the wastewater fund? So I will ask, so is it fair to say the, these last two funds, the water and the wastewater utilities, the money that is collected into these utilities stays in these utilities? It, it is spent within these utilities for infrastructure, for the operations, for the salaries. It is not as though it, the water fund funds parks. It doesn't fund roads. It's the water and wastewater uh, revenues fund water and wastewater improvements, correct? Yes, Mayor, that is that is correct. Anything else, Council? Very good. Okay. Uh, Third one is the stormwater utility fund, and that provides the operations, maintenance, and improvements to the storm sewer system. So that is done through a storm utility fee that's charged to property owners. And so this fee is intended to recover costs associated with providing storm water utility service to residents and commercial establishments. And the results of this work lead to flood mitigation, asset protection, healthy waterways, roadway safety, and improved infrastructure. There it goes. Oh, I went too far. So uh, before we get to that one, I'll just go back to the graph that has some comparison between other cities. There it goes. So um, on this graph, Brian, um, he's, he actually has, this is 2022 rates, but he's also inserted with that um, orange bar there, the, the proposed 2023 rate. So um, you can see that um, for this graph, Bloomington's kind of in the upper middle for storm rates. Uh, we're currently at $99.48 for the year, and uh, the proposed would be um, 
$104.88 for the year. Um, and so on this graph, Champlin is the lowest at $68 for the year, and Minneapolis is the highest at $210. So the storm water rates are determined by land use category at a per acre rate. And we are proposing a 5.5% increase. Um, each single family residential lot is considered to be uh, one third of an acre. So the proposed 2023 rate would be um, an increase of 46 cents per month going from $8.29 to that $8.75. And then this is the long-term model for the stormwater utility. It has a proposed, for the 23 budget, proposing revenue of $7.7 .7 million and proposed expenses of $9.4 million. So that includes $4.7 million for capital projects and um, also one million for paying debt service. So there were some bonds that were taken out for past stormwater uh, projects. And the uh, working capital balance is, is projected. You can see it's gonna dip down below that 90%, which is why it goes from green to yellow, um, but should be um, coming back in line above 90% in 2031 on our projections. So that's the stormwater utility. Council, any questions on the stormwater utility? Comments? Very good. Thank you. Moving on. One more. So the solid waste fund utility um, has a lot of different pieces in it. It is citywide garbage, recycling, organics recycling, and yard waste, as well as our bulky item management program. There's also a part in here that has uh, for forestry, so removal of disease, removal and replacement of diseased trees. And um, also we have funds in reserve if there's a major storm, if there's a major storm cleanup that's needed. And um, also private property environmental health abatements run through this fund. So um, for the garbage rates, um, the rate increases for small, medium, and large garbage carts are on this chart that Laura shared back in October. So 4.71% uh, increase for small garbage cart, 4.59 for medium, and 4.51 for large. Um, the rate drivers um, for the garbage rates are, kind of, are listed on this uh, slide. Um, next for recycling, uh, we have a proposed 3% increase. Um, it was a little lower than we were expecting because there was a very uh, favorable recycling commodity adjustment um, offset fee, and that can change from year to year, but it kind of worked in our favor uh, for this year. The organics recycling rate, this is the newest service that began in March 2022. Um, I think the feeling on this was just New rate still rolling out. We just wanted to keep the uh, the rate flat. We didn't want to increase this one. Um, the bulky item management rate, so formerly the curbside cleanup rate, this changed a lot. This is actually going down by 16% um, because the curbside cleanup, as you know, was a very expensive event or is a very expensive event, and that cost has gone up exponentially every year. So now that it's changing to an every other year, it allows us to reduce this rate. Um, but we are, um, they are also adding additional programs that will be funded through this rate. But, um, and we, we do know that as we're modeling it out that the cost of curbside cleanup when we do it every other year will continue to increase. So when you put all of those things together, um, and we did a weighted average at the bottom, um, we have the small, medium, and large garbage carts. So because of that bulky item fee going down, it's an increase of less than 1% on average, so 0.81%. 
And here is the long-term budget model for the solid waste fund. So budgeted revenues are just over 10.7 million and total budgeted expenses for 23 are just over 9.9 .9 million. So before I get into the, the recap of all of them together, are there any questions for solid waste? Councilmember Loman, a question on the solid waste and refuse collection fees. The mayor, more a comment. Um, I just um, wanted to to, uh, to mention that uh, with respect to some of those rates that we're seeing, that staff is uh, working through um, uh, uh, working through a process by which we talked about it at our sustainability. Um, um, Solid Waste Committee uh, just this past week to just remind <laughs> remind myself because I always keep asking about it, uh, but they are working on trying to figure out ways in terms of looking at these rates to try to figure out ways to to bring some of them down, uh, basing it on uh, you know how you utilize the program and trying to if you're more sustainable and those types of things. So I just wanted to mention that that uh, with what we've done with the um, what used to be the spring cleanup program staff uh, you know really came back to council and uh, uh, commissions and looked to find ways in which to try to optimize that kind of moving forward it took a little bit of time uh, to, to do that we're a council in that same process if it were hopefully I'm being uh, you know genuine with this but it's going to take some time that staff has kind of commented they're going to look at that and figure out a way in which what's the best way kind of forward so I think that residents just need to know uh, that staff is working on that and trying to find a way to uh, to kind of optimize that uh, uh, so as we move forward that uh, we can great create the best experience for our, our residents. I know a number of other council members have also uh, expressed uh, and, and uh, uh, spoken to this too as well. So, Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. A, a quick question and apologies. You might have touched on this and it just didn't compute. So uh, with our organics uh, recycling rate holding steady at 550, I see we still have about $200,000 estimated revenue jump in that line item. Uh, I'm looking at it's page 31 in the packet, just the overview for the waste fund. Uh, so just wondering if, if it's citywide that 550 is levied and it's staying the same where that extra 200 grand came from. Uh, Mayor, council members, council member Martin, um, I, I think the reason for the increase is that we're we're hoping to grow that program and have more. Um, it only started in March of this year, so we. Um, I think we were, you know, budgeting conservatively for 2022 and just starting it in March. But we'll have it for the entire year of oh. 2024 or 2023, and hopefully also the the goal is to increase. Um, uh, well, actually, I take that back. It won't. It won't. Um, we have more people using it. It won't increase the revenue, but it's. Um, I think it's because it's the entire uh, year as opposed to just part of the year. And I know, I don't know if Carl, Keel, if you have any more. Mr. Keel, yeah. anything to add here? That, that is one portion of it, but probably the, the bulk of it is we're expecting to get a larger portion of the SCORE grant or the monies that the county collects uh, because we have, have a full year of, of organic recycling, we get a larger piece of that pie. Okay. So that's the bulk of that 200 grand. Okay, gotcha. Um, and this is uh, maybe a, a conversation for another time, but just I'd be curious as this conversation moves along and we start hitting, say, 60%, 70% participation citywide, because uh, we've seen modeling for an opt-in system where half a percent of residents participate in the exorbitant costs and then kind of levied city citywide like we do here. But I'm just curious, at some point, does an opt-in system, once the city has been introduced to it, residents see the value and the vast majority of residents are participating? What does that cost structure look like? Because hopefully we'll be there pretty soon. So. Council Member D'Alessandro. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one, one quick, um, uh, forgive me, but I, I don't remember this and I was blanking on trying to find it in my notes. Um, the curbside, the curbside uh, or bulky item management uh, fees, we are we are collecting them every billing cycle, even though the program has gone to every two years. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Delisandro. So it is a bulky management fee, and there's some other um, programs that will have. I go back to that slide. I didn't go into the details of that. Um, so Laura uh, talked about that in more detail 
back in October. Right. But it's going to, um, it covers the reimagined every other year curbside cleanup. Um, so setting funds aside to do f that cleanup every other year, an annual community drop-off event, one or two community swap events, um, and then regular uh, curbside collection of reusable and recyclable bulky items. Um, and then a portion of that rates also if we have a major storm event as well. Sure. Definition of bulky item cleanup, I guess. Um, okay, so 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 for the layman here, instead of four forty two, they're going to pay three seventy one. They're going to pay three seventy one every month on their bill, um, and or that would be seven forty two, right? Did I do the math right? Every other cycle, since it's a utility bill, math. Um, <laughs> Made it, uh, 742 every billing cycle, and and uh, for that we are we are reducing that rate so that number one we are um, so in addition to adding more programs like the drop off event and the community swap events, um, we are in fact also being able to, able to decrease the overall number itself. Right? Is that a great sum? That was not a great summary. I'll just call it a summary. <laughs> am I am I reading all that correctly? Yeah. Added, added programs and still were able to reduce the cost because we went to the two year every two years. Yes, Mayor, uh, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, that, that is correct because right. um, on this next slide. That has the long term model. It shows there's a line in the expenses for curbside cleanup. And so it's about like one. We're projecting it at one point four million dollars in twenty twenty four. So um, that is taking that out at least every other year is what is why we're able to do that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you, Councilmember Loman. So um, one thing I'm just concerned about because I've seen this before at uh, Councilmember Dallas Hunter's uh, point um, is that there is concern with the the increase of that pickup though because that that market keeps on increasing. Uh, so I just have we captured that in in the in the out years in terms of you know do we think that that number is real or is that going to increase substantially? Because my understanding was that that you know as we go further out, uh, even though we've gone to every other year, that's still we're going to see an increase. Uh, so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that you know this is just a projection and a forecast, and that number could come in at a higher number, and we're expecting that, right? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, we are expecting it to increase. So, for example, in this this past year, it was about $1.1 $1 million, and we think it's going to be $1.4 million we have in the model for 24, and then uh, $1.5 million for 26. So we'll keep looking at that as, as we're doing you know, each year's budget, but... I don't know if anybody's able, able to, to talk about some of those drivers at all, but I think that would be helpful for a resident to know that. I, I don't want to get you on the spot, so if nobody can speak to that, you know, I just remember, you know, that, that took my interest when, I, when that, that came up uh, the time before, and I'm not sure, Mayor, if you remember that at all <laughs> when we talked about this many years ago, but I'm just very concerned that we, you know, that that, that number can increase. Councilman Bowman and Mayor, thanks for having me on. I apologize that I was not on earlier for the early questions, but you are correct. There's a lot of drivers that continue to affect that rate for the curbside cleanup service. Um, the number one being the cost of landfill items just continues to increase significantly each year for that service. And now that would be every other year. Our consortium haulers need to kind of go out to bid to landfills to get that price. So we are a little bit at the whim of the prices that the landfill set for us. Um, the, the service takes place on a Saturday. Oftentimes the landfills aren't open on a Saturday, so they, they don't like to accept the material so they can you know, increase the cost there. Um, and those bulky items are not very attractive for landfills because they take up a lot of space. And as we know, the capacity at landfills has continued to be an issue. So this past year, the cost just to landfill those items did increase by 25% for this year's cleanup. So in the future years, we are really continuing to project significant increases in that landfill cost. And then again, with our contract with the consortium, the price for the collection of those items continues to increase each year as well. So um, we are still able to bring down the 
bulky item management rate is what we'll call that going forward because the curbside cleanup will be offered at an every other year rate. Um, however, as you will note, it's not, it can't be reduced by a 50% rate, even though because it's a every other year program, because we do know that the cost of that program to operate curbside cleanup will continue to increase. And as Kari noted, we are adding in several new components to our bulky item management service that will also be uh, funded through this new, uh, the new rate. Thank you for jumping in there, Ms. Horner. Appreciate it. Thanks. Council, anything else? Please so continue. Before I have the slide for the public hearing, um, just we shared this last time too, but this just brings everything together so you can see all of it. Um, so the and this is based on like what we said, where we get the bill every eight weeks. It's bi monthly. Um, so also on there, we replaced the citywide curbside cleanup fee that you'll just see in the 2022 columns with the new line for bulky item management fee. So that's that's highlighted in blue. So you can see that in 22, it's got citywide curbside cleanup and then in 23, it's bulky item management fee. So taking everything together, so the first um, section there, small garbage, minimal water use would be an increase of $2.95 for a two month period or $17.70 for the year. So that's kind of minimal usage. If you took a medium garbage cart, medium water, medium recycling, um, and we would use, um, it would be an increase of $6.67 for a two month period or $40 a year. And then large garbage, large water um, could be an increase of around $14.73 for that two month period or $88 a year. And then this last slide I have um, just has everything that we just went through on one slide with the increases or decrease. And that is the end of my slides. Council, questions on the summary, bringing it all together? I am not, uh, oh. remember, D'Alessandro? Uh, very quickly, Mr. Mayor, I I, I wonder um, at some point if if we can. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure I understand necessarily how the um, capital the capital allocations are 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 determined such that we keep a certain amount of dollars in um, each of these funds. Um, and so I think it might be, a, um, worth us at some point helping residents understand a little bit why, because it could look like a fairly large reserve and then they're wondering why we're still raising the rates and things like that. And so a, a, a bit of an understanding about that might be helpful. I obviously not for tonight. Um, but I think, um, it would be good for us to maybe put something out about that um, so that people have a sense for why those things are what they are. Um, otherwise, I would just say, um, as somebody, as you all know, I care a lot about our climate change concerns, and we have this, uh, we have something at a strategic level I think we need to address, and that is simply that the, you know, water usage is the thing that drives revenue, but water usage is not something we want to encourage, <laughs> right? We want to be responsible about it. And so with climate change impacts to that, you know, as evidence, we're not 10, I think we're below 10 inches this year in terms of the water that we need. You know, we, we, we should probably be looking at some other mitigation strategies there too. So I realize I probably shouldn't have maybe addressed these at this moment, uh, but I think they're things that we should keep in mind and, and help our residents understand as we go forward. I appreciate your questions, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. I, I agree. We could have the longer discussion about working sure. capital goals. I think that's in. I yeah. mean, that's a. It's in. It's a good discussion to have. But basically, it's the ultimate rainy day funds. If something goes kaboom, do we have the money to fix it right then and there? So that that's uh, that, that's it. And um, your question about uh, water usage, it's kind of the the flip side of the coin of the question that you asked earlier about the twelve thousand gallon level. And it's the balance of, is it unfair to larger families 
perhaps. I mean, we, we can have that discussion, but there's also the goal, and we, I remember this discussion very clearly when we came up with this level with the different tiers for the water levels, the water rates, that it, it was meant to encourage water conservation. We didn't want it to be a, it's, a it, it's an asset that everybody needs, but we wanted to make sure that people, if they, if they uh, overused it, that they had to pay a price that then would either deter them from doing so or provided more financial resources to somehow offset that. So it's, it, it's the other side of the coin to the question that you mentioned earlier. So a, did, I, did I state that correctly? A, all right, good. All right, thank you. Council, anything else? Very good. Then let's go to our 2023 utility fund rates public hearing. And I'm assuming that we're going to break this down rate, uh, fund by fund. Uh, yes. The presentation was all at once, but we're going to break this down in the public hearings fund by fund. Very good. So we will go, we will now open. Uh, our first public hearing of the evening, item 4.1. This is a public hearing on the ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates. Is there anyone in the city council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Mr. Brillert, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 4.1? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have one call in. Uh, attendee here and let's uh why don't we just go ahead and ask them at the top of the public hearings which item they're here to speak on so caller with the phone number beginning with nine five two six nine three uh could you let us know which item uh, you'd like to speak on tonight if any you are unmuted Or perhaps no, not. we do not have anyone. We don't have anyone. Okay. Center. Last call for anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.1. Council, no one on the phone and no one coming forward. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.1. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.1 this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council, any additional comments, questions on uh, the ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates? If not, I would look for action, Council. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I move to, to adopt an ordinance amending um, Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase water and wastewater rates as indicated in Chapter 11. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to adopt the ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase water and wastewater rates as indicated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman, summary publication. Mayor, I'll move to adopt a resolution directing summary publication of the ordinance to increase water and wastewater rates. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin for summary publication on item 4.1. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We will move on to item 4.2 on the agenda. This is our second public hearing. This regarding an ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. I will open the public hearing now and ask if there's anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2 this evening. Anyone? Mr. Brillert? What does our phone situation look like? Anyone wishing to speak on item 4.2? Well, Mr. Mayor, we have the same call and user. Why don't we try them one more time to see if we can identify if they're here to good. Uh, testify on anything tonight. So caller with the phone number. Hey. Oh, there you are. Uh, could you let us know which uh, item you're looking to testify on tonight, please? Um, I was just calling in about the public hearing for the pavement managing program. And okay. Just waiting up, uh, here on that. So thank you. Very good. We're, we're, we're coming up on that, and uh, so hang tough with us. We are. That's coming up shortly here. So thank you. Thank last, you thanks. Uh, last call for anybody in the chambers who wishes to speak to item four point two. Council, no one on the phone. No one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item four point two. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember um, 
Coulter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.2. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0, closing the public hearing on item 4.2. Council, any questions? Any comments? Anything to bring forward regarding item 4.2 this evening? Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Just a quick one, and I, I think um, Ms. Carlson may have alluded to it earlier. I just wanted to clarify that part of the reason that there is not a ton of discussion about these items tonight is that we had previously examined them at at a council meeting I think it was about a month ago so we already had our, our the lion's share of our discussion just didn't want folks to think we were just kind of not doing our due diligence here so good point thank you council member council anything else to add seeing no hands going up council member Coulter uh, Mayor, excuse me. I will move to adopt an ordinance amending Appendix A of the Bloomington City Code to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees indicated in Chapter 11. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the ordinance amending Appendix A of the Code to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees indicated in Chapter 11. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Coulter. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution directing, directing summary publication of an ordinance to increase solid waste and refuse collection fees. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro for summary publication on item 4.2. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 4.3, a resolution to change stormwater charges. <coughs> Is there anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.3? Mr. Brillert, do we have any additional folks on the phone? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we do not. Very good. Last call in the council chambers. Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward. I'd uh, look for a motion to, um, I, we'd never, officially we didn't have a public hearing on this in, in, the, in the motion sheet. Am I correct on this, Ms. Manderscheid? Just want to be sure. Mayor, I'm double checking on the agenda this cover page. Uh, doesn't, list one on the doesn't list one on the cover page. My my apologies. There's just a resolution to change stormwater charges. It's different. So, Council, is there any additional discussion on this? Ms. Carlson. I was, Mayor, uh, Council, I was, I was just going to say the stormwater uh, charges are d different than the other ones, so there's no public hearing required for those. It's Thank you for that resolution. clarification. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Here I was just zipping on through and was wrong. I was in my groove, that's right, I was sitting <laughs> stride. Council, any questions on item 4.3? If not, I would look for action on item 4.3. I can make that motion, Mr. Mayor. Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, I move to adopt a resolution establishing a basic system rate for the purpose of calculating storm water drainage charges pursuant to section 16.15 of the city code. Second. Motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin, to establish the to adopt the resolution establishing a basic system rate as noted. No further discussion on this, Council. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries 7-0. Item 4.4, looking at a resolution approving our 2023 utility fund budgets. Council, is there any discussion on this? Questions? I look for action. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to move that. Council Member Martin. I will move that we adapt a resolution adopting the 2023 water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste enterprise fund budgets. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Lohman to adopt our 2023 water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste enterprise fund budgets. No further council discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. That brings us to item 4.5 in the evening. And uh, our Chief Financial Officer, Lori Economy Scholler, is going to talk about a uh, resolution to amend the 2022 fees and charges schedule. And this, we will have a public comment opportunity on this one. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Earlier this evening in the consent area, you approved a new credit card policy for the city. And with that, um, there are... It's not out there. There are two um, 
fees in the fee schedule that need to that will be impacted by that credit card fee that we would want to put out there. One is at the Ice Garden for um, events, ticketed events, and um, one is for hydrant activities. So those would go into place now. Um, when you see the the next fee schedule, which is the entire fee schedule in the next couple of weeks, the credit card fee will um, impact other areas. So. Matt, that's not the correct one. This is all, those were the three policies that you approved earlier today. So with that, um, it is just those two areas that we would have the fees on. The fees range from 2.75% to 5%. Um, the one at the Bloomington Arts Garden would also include uh, a, a 50 cent transaction fee on top of it. Both of those were in the packet describing what they are. Um, we'll be utilizing different softwares in those areas. So it just made sense um, for us to incorporate those costs um, with the third party vendors there at that point so that we can ease transactions at both of those locations. So with also, this- question on this? And because we didn't have the uh, the PowerPoint, just to, to clarify, there's two new Footer notes basically is what we're approving here yes. to indicate where the credit card service fees will be charged and they will be charged on Ice Garden ticketed events hosted at Big and regarding in utilities regarding hydrant services. Is that correct? Yes, it is, Mayor. Thank you. Very good. Council, anything on this? Very good. As I mentioned, as we open this, uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on item 4.5. Is there anyone in the chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.5 this evening? Anyone? No one coming forward, so I'll close the public comment opportunity. And Council, I will look for action on M4.5 this evening. Council Member Lohman. Be happy to make that uh, <clears throat> motion to adopt a resolution approving an amendment to uh, credit card services fees in the 2022 schedule fees and changes of services provided by departments and divisions of the city of Bloomington, Minnesota, other than those established by ordinance. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Martin to adopt the resolution approving an amendment to credit card service fees in the 2022 schedule of fees and charges for services. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item 4.6 on our agenda as a public hearing, an ordinance to rename uh, a public street in the city of Bloomington. We don't get this very often, but here we are with the second time and not too long. We're going to be renaming a public street, uh, possibly. Julie Long, our city engineer, is going to lead us through this. Good evening, Ms. Long. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council, um, Schmidt Music has moved into their new facility, which was formerly the Life Touch building, which is located at the northwest corner of 494 and highway 100 it is currently the road is currently named picture drive and that made sense when it was life touch now that it is Sch schmidt music they would like to have it renamed as harmony drive um, this goes into our street g renaming um, requirements they submitted a petition there are two properties that abut that road and both of them um, signed the petition um, the cost for the street signs is $302.57. The 57 cents is my favorite part of it. Um, and Schmidt Music would pay for those new signs. The, as I mentioned earlier, there are two parcels that currently adjoin Picture Drive, Schmidt Music, and then the Sheridan Bloomington Hotel. But only one of them is actually addressed off of that, that road. Um, it's the parcel owned by Schmidt Music. Uh, Planning Commission approved the name change at their meeting on October 27th. And so my item is a suggested motion to rename the street. And, and to be clear, two properties abut, but only one property address will be affected. Correct. Only one set of letterhead, one, one return address labels, all of that would just affect the Schmidt Music property itself. Correct. Very good. Council, any questions on this? No questions from the council? I will open our public hearing. We have a public hearing on this, item 4.6, an ordinance to rename the public street of Picture Drive to Harmony Drive. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to this? 
No one coming forward? Anything, Mr. Brillert? No? All right. Last call in the chambers? Very good. Council, I will look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Lowman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on item 4.6. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council, any discussion on this? If not, I would look for action. Councilmember Lowman. On that note, I'll go ahead and give it a shot here. In the interest of the public to adopt an ordinance approving the public street name change of Picture Drive to Harmony Drive. Second. A motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin, to adopt an ordinance approving the public street name of Picture Drive to Harmony Drive. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item 4.7. Another public hearing. This is to approve the feasibility study and order the 2023 Pavement Management Program Street Reconstruction Project. We have with us tonight Brian Hansen and Christian Nagano from our <coughs> Streets Department to uh, lead us all through this. Good evening, welcome. Excellent. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, as you mentioned, Christian and I are here this, this evening to uh, present to you the proposed uh, 2023 Pavement Management Program. Um, I'm going to have Christian start us off here with some information about the program itself. I'm going to provide some information about the assessment portion of it, and then at the end we'll be available for questions and public hearings. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christian. Good evening, Mr. Gano. Welcome. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. A uh, slight correction here. My last name is Anago. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. My apologies, Anago. That's My apologies. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Um, in these next few slides, I will talk about um, the PMP program, um, the reasons why we have a PMP program. I'll try to show uh, how the PMP program improves the pavement life cycle of our roadways and then what the current program is like and um, some of the funding sources on the program. I'll also give a schedule of uh, what um, going forward will look like if the project were to be awarded, uh, ordered this afternoon or this evening. So without further ado, <coughs> excuse me here, what is the pavement management program. The current PMP program is the city's proactive effort to maintain and improve the current 340 miles of uh, city street that we're responsible for in Bloomington. To achieve this goal, the city implements three different type of uh, road improvement and maintenance technique. The reconstruct, which is the project that we're concerned considering this, uh, this evening, the million overlay, the, and the street steel code. <clears throat> Each of these techniques are used under different circumstances, taking into account the age and the remaining usable life of the roadway. In order to correctly group these streets in their respective categories, the city used a classification system called the Pavement Condition Index, PCI for short. Each year, city maintenance staff inspects one third of the city's street to gather information that then is used to update the PCI rating of the streets. From that updated classification and other factors, such as the age of the roadway, the, 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 the roadway maintenance history, the condition of the subgrade, uh, the staff is able to put together our future project map, which is projected about five years in the future. What does the, uh, what does the PMP do for us in Bloomington? It helps us reduce the overall cost of maintaining the infrastructure by taking the right action at the right time and also by managing the assessment allocation to the adjacent property owners and to the overall taxpayers in Bloomington. Why do we have a PMP program? So prior to the PMP program, the systems that were in place led to failure. So basically neighborhoods, residents in the neighborhood would petition the city to get uh, a reconstruction project to occur in their neighborhood. And there was, no, there was no scheduled program that prolonged the life cycle of the roadway. The PMP program addresses this issue by providing the city with a systematic approach to maintaining the, the city's infrastructure. How does the PMP program improve the pavement life cycle? If you look at the, the, the diagram on the left, it's, uh, so the two diagrams are uh, comparative life cycle analysis of two roadway segments. The segment on the left is a, is a roadway segment that is not on the current PMP program. And you can see that from the construction of the street, when it's just left to deteriorate without any form of maintenance to the point where another reconstruction is uh, 
uh, warranted. On the right, you can see that by applying the different techniques that we discussed earlier, and then that by doing them at scheduled intervals, we're able to extend the usable life of the street pretty significantly. What is the current PMP program? The current PMP program includes typically about 3.5 to 4.5 miles of street reconstruct, 10 miles of overlay, and 9 to 10 miles of overlay, and 30 miles of uh, silk code. This year's reconstruction project that we're recommending ordering tonight includes 3.25 miles of street reconstruction and has the singularity of also including 0.8 mile of uh, street overlay. And there's a, there's, a, there's a reason to that. The reason for that, <coughs> excuse me. The reason for this is that the Vasey neighborhood that initially was planned to be fully uh, reconstructed, and then you can see on there that uh, we have streets in blue that are planned to be uh, overlaid, and the street in red are the proposed reconstruct for this year. So the Vasey neighborhood that was initially planned to be fully reconstructed includes segments like Yosemite Road, West 106th Street that were reconstructed as part of the PMP program in 1999 and 2000, and West 104th Street, Willwood Road, and Zion Avenue. These segments are not in a condition that would require full reconstruct at this time. However, they're showing signs of scabbing and surface deteriorations that can be corrected with the mill and overlay. Furthermore, these roads are the routes in and out of these neighborhoods, so it would make sense to, recon to at least do some sort of maintenance treatment to them as part of this project and then keeping, keeping the overall uh, uh, neighborhood on the same maintenance schedule. What are the goals of the PMP? <clears throat> By doing a combination of the three techniques that we talked about earlier in the proportion that are described in these slides, here, oh, if I can just go back. So by doing a combination of the three techniques that we discussed earlier, and then by applying them in the proportion that are described here, the city is able to maintain an overall city PCI of above a 70. And I believe we've been successful at that because the numbers show that in, 26, in 2021, our overall PCI was 76, and in 2022, it was 78. It is important, however, to note that the city PCI for the year 2023 is 2023 is expected to drop by a few unit points. And the reason for that is that due to the various proc procurement issues and uh, supply chain issues with getting bituminous material, the, the, the maintenance staff was not able to complete our typical 30 miles of seal coat. So this is gonna negatively, negatively affect our overall PCI in the, in, in the next year. This is also reminiscent of what happened in 2020 where a uh, si situation similar to this one happened and uh, we couldn't get material to do the seal code and then our, our, our PCI dropped from 2019 to 2020. What are the PMP funding sources? So this slide shows the breakdown of our various funding sources between the reconstruct, the overlay, and the street seal code and trails. The biggest difference here is in the, two fir the first two rows with the reconstruct funding coming from the special assessments and the city issuing bonds. And meanwhile, the overlay and the seal code trails comes out of our franchise fees. The schedule looking forward is as follows. Should the project be ordered today, engineering staff will then work on developing the plans and specification over uh, with the intent of beating the project the earliest possible in the spring of 2023. Construction will then occur in the summer of 2023, and then uh, Brian and I will be back before council in the fall of 2023 to order the special assessment. With that, I'll pass it along to Brian to give the rest of the presentation. Excellent. Yep. Thank you, Christian. Um, so I'm gonna speak a little bit to the special assessment portion of the reconstruct project. Um, as you're all aware, um, the special assessment tool is used to fund a portion of our PMP reconstruct project. So the city's policy for, sub, or for assessing properties has been in place since 1962. Um, our calculation, we use an adjusted front footage. So as you've heard before from me, that uh, tends to equate all lots as though they're rectangular lot. And there's adjusted front footage that is uh, calculated for each parcel within the city, within the city excuse me. And then that frontage multiplied by the rate of the improvement that they're being assessed for is how they determine their final assessment rate. 
Um, so this slide here shows the calculated assessment, estimated assessment rates for the two improvements that are subject to an assessment with the proposed 2023 PMP project. Um, as Christian mentioned, there is a couple streets in there, street segments that are being considered for overlay as part of the reconstruct project this year, which is unique. So these costs here are only, only applied to the streets that are being fully reconstructed. So you can see here we have an estimated cost of about $5 million for the, for the surfacing portion of the reconstruct project. Um, again, the total adjusted front footage of all the properties that are subject to an assessment for that in particular improvement is shown there at 28,113. So we divide that by the total cost to give us our 100% cost. That would be the cost per foot we would need to assess or charge, excuse me, all properties by their adjusted front footage to pay for that improvement 100% through assessments. Um, that is not the city's policy. We assess it at 25% and 50% rate. For a single two and three family residents, we assess it at 25% rate. And for all other property types, we use that 50% rate. So you can see the estimated cost per foot for those two. Um, again, for the curb and gutter, we do the same exercise. You can see here that typically our curb and gutter total amount is, is higher. You may have uh, seen this as a lower number. Reason being is we are running out of streets that don't have curb and gutter right now. So this year on the proposed PMP project, we only have one street segment that does not currently have curb and gutter in place. Um, and our policy is to assess for curb and gutter in its initial installation. Therefore, there's only uh, one neighborhood that's subject to a curb and gutter assessment this year. So again, taking that total cost divided by the AFF of all the properties adjacent to that street, you get your cost per foot for that 100% rate and then our 25 and 50% rate. So estimated assessments were provided to all properties adjacent to a street being considered tonight for the, the PMP project, and those were sent out to them prior to tonight's meeting. This slide just shows uh, the assessment policies of other cities and how they apply those assessment rates for single two and three family and other property types to kind of see how Bloomington falls in um, as part of uh, the overall city and, and some of our peer communities and how they apply special assessments as part of their PMP projects or their reconstruction projects for their streets. Um, quickly, or not quickly, I'm just gonna touch on the assessment payment options. So if the project is ordered this evening, um, as Christian mentioned, uh, we would go out um, and have uh, final assessments calculated next fall and be back before the council in the fall to have you consider the assessment role and the levying of the assessments. Um, important to note for properties that may be uh, uh, subject to an assessment if the project is ordered, um, that once this assessment is levied, they would have until November 29th of 2023 for that prepayment window. So typically we come to the council that first meeting in October. So seven to eight weeks between levying of the assessments if they're to be levied till that date to prepay. So if your uh, property is being considered for part of the reconstruct this year and you're thinking about prepaying that, um, that's a date to keep in mind that we need to have that payment uh, made by that date. After that date, whatever balance is remaining is automatically rolled onto the property tax statement. Um, it's spread out evenly over 10 years. So, um, and then the interest would be applied to that on an annual basis on a declining principle. Um, so if a property owner was to be part of the PMP project, were, were assessed, chose not to prepay any amount, the first time they would see a bill for this project would be with their May of 2024 property tax statement. Um, at any time after it's, it's assessed, they do have the ability to pay it off in full and avoid additional interest if they so choose. And then lastly, we do have a hardship deferral uh, program as well. So for prop people that qualify for that, they can uh, apply for this hardship deferral program. It does not, it's not a forgiveness of the assessment, but it is a deferral of it. Um, so as long as they meet the criteria, they can defer that assessment. Um, and we can help people with that if they uh, feel like they qualify or want to pursue that um, after the assessment is actually levied. Um, just a quick summary of the property owner contact we've had to date. So, we have had information on the PMP uh, page on the city's website um, with information, the informational slides we provided at our, at our public meetings, as well as uh, information regarding tonight's public hearing. Um, we did send direct mailings out to all properties adjacent to streets being considered this evening for the reconstruct project. Included in that was the information about tonight's meeting, as well as that estimated assessment I had mentioned before. Um, we also had the legal notice in the Sun Current that ran for the last two uh, publications. And then we did hold two informational meetings over in the uh, Public Works building in uh, late October um, for pr uh, properties that were or property owners, excuse me, adjacent to the streets being considered this evening. And then both Christian and myself, along with other staff, have been answering questions prior to the meetings. Um, during the meetings, we had a Q&A as well. Those questions were included in your agenda item this uh, evening. And then since that meeting, Christian and I have also been answering questions from residents as well. So in, uh, in summary, uh, the PMP program, as Christian mentioned, it's the right action at the right time. It helps the city prolong our payment life, um, reduces the overall cost of maintenance of that asset that we do maintain, and helps maintain the city's infrastructure.
And with that, uh, we do have a suggested motion and just some uh, language in here about that Christian mentioned, if the project were to be ordered, that staff would be back um, next fall with the assessment role for your consideration as well. At this time, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions for Mr. Nago or Mr. Hanson? I see no hands going up. Thank you much. This is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing on item 4.7 right now. This is a public hearing to approve feasibility study and order 2023 Pavement Management Program Street Reconstruction Project. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak on item 4.7 this evening? Please come forward. Good evening. I'll have you, if I could have you sign in, please. And then as you start, if you could state your name. And I will thank you in advance for your patience while we got through the rest of our agenda before we got to this. Uh, my name is Charlie Cooper. Uh, thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Um, I spoke with Christian. He was very gracious and, and helpful. Uh, my residence um, on Bessie Road, <clears throat> it, it kind of sits in a low spot, it seems. And uh, I asked to make sure that the grading was considered when they were making the, the road reconstruction. Um, and then I thought about it. it. It still might be, <laughs> it grading might not help. There might be a need or a call for a, a gutter, and I just uh, would like to have that under con some consideration or something if, if the grading isn't adequate, if we could get another uh, storm sewer put in, I would appreciate it. Very good. Uh, Kristen, you have that? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of council, yes, I've spoken with the residents and then we're looking at uh, different options here. First one being uh, having our survey crews out there and just gather some topo uh, topographic data and then we'll look at the best way of addressing that. If uh, we I have to point out that there's an, there's an, it's an area with an existing curb already, so putting in a new um, storm, storm sewer may be a little challenging at that point, but it, it, uh, like I said, we're looking at different options of addressing that. And then if um, grading is not the best option, then we'll go for what can provide a better Very solution at that point. Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming you'll keep in contact with Mr. Cooper and you uh, will? Absolutely. Perfect. You good, Mr. Cooper? Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? Is there somebody on the phone regarding this matter? I was going to get to them as soon as we were done with everybody here. So, all right. Mr. Brillert? We do have someone on the phone. Indeed, we do. Uh, caller with the phone number beginning with 952 693. Your line is unmuted. Hello, my name is Brooke Guler. Uh, I live on Clinton Avenue. Um, I was just wondering um, how our street was selected and why it was selected specifically. Yeah, talking with um, other neighbors, it sounds like this street was redone not ter too terribly long ago, and uh, it's going to cost a about $4,000 for the street to be reconstructed when it sounds like there was a major undertaking um, not terribly long ago uh, with a similar project that lasted the whole summer. Um, so we're just kind of curious why our street has been chosen for a complete reconstruction um, when it seems like a project like that wasn't so, so long ago, and it is at pretty significant expense to us as residents. Thank you. Very good. Yes, and, and I know it's a significant expense. It definitely is. And, but I also know that our, our city staff evaluates each street very carefully and, and comes to this conclusion. And I'll turn it over um, to Mr. Inago to explain it or to or this is a tag team. Good, Here we go. Good evening, Mayor and members. Good evening, Bob. Bob Simons, uh, senior civil engineer in our engineering department. I'll, I'll jump in here real quick. Um, I took a look at uh, when I believe it was Clinton Avenue that the caller called in about. Uh, the PCI for that stretch of roadway is in the low 30s right now. One of the reasons why that is on our reconstruct and our outlook for our reconstruct program. I don't know of any um, recent large projects that occurred on that street. We did seal it back, seal coat it back in 2013 
is what I see from our maintenance history. There may have been a, a private utility project, like Centerpoint Energy may have been in there or some other private utility in the past. I know, I know Centerpoint Energy has been in that neighborhood over the past few years, um, so that's probably what the resident is referring to. But overall, in regards to our program, Clinton Avenue kind of falls right into that, into our, the program in regards to the condition that it's in and why it's been selected to, to be reconstructed this year. And to be clear, Mr. Simon, so a, a, a 30 out of 100 means that the street is what? Typically, it, if, if it's in the range from zero to the upper 30s, that's typically in our, in our reconstruction range where it's not cost effective for us to be um, milling and overlaying or seal coating that roadway anymore at this point. It's gotten to the point where if we would seal it or we'd mill and overlay it, the PCI would be dropping quickly, uh, much too quickly for it to be cost effective for us to continue. So and how did the, the engineering department come about deciding to do this street, we, your evaluation of the streets uh, in that area and across the city? Uh, Mayor, when we, when we do that, as Christian mentioned when he went through his presentation, uh, one-third of the city streets are evaluated every year. Cracks are counted, potholes are monitored, um, overall in, uh, condition of the street is monitored. That's entered into our, our PMP database, our ICON software program. That gives us that pavement condition index, and it also gives us uh, uh, the, um, the future, what the future pavement condition index may be based on a, a, dec a decay curve for that street segment. So we use that, and we also drive the streets each spring before we come forward with any of these projects to make sure that they are indeed in a condition that, that would um, require them to be reconstructed. So I hope that answers your question. It, it does. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Councilmember Loman, a question? Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Mayor, for, for that. Uh, you know, if, if um, uh, utility work had been done uh, on uh, that street uh, in the past, what impact would that have uh, on that PCI, uh, if any? Uh, uh, Mayor, Councilmember Loman, uh, if work was done in the past, typically, um, if we come through and we're for our, and, mo and um, rate the streets, we're counting cracks and things of that nature. Typically, if there was private utility work that was done and patching and stuff like that was done in the area, that doesn't have too great of an impact on that on that pavement condition index. Um, any work that they would do, they they put a, a patch over it, similar to what our maintenance crews would do if they come in to patch the area. Um, but um, if it, if it being center point energy that was in the area, typically their work is just a pothole here or there, and they're boring boring utilities, mo most private utilities, they're boring the utilities underground, so there's just spot locations where they would be doing that work. It typically wouldn't be an entire street, ripping up the entire street to do that work, so if that answers your question. Okay. Council, additional questions? Very good. Please, if... Uh Anyone else wishing to speak on this? Please come up forward. Mayor Bussey and council members. Good evening. Bless. I live on Vesey Road, and this is a hardship for a lot of people, uh, seniors, retired. Um, and I guess my, my question is, because um, everybody's assessment is different. So we all use the same street to get to our homes. Uh, why wouldn't that just be even across the board for all homeowners? And, and that's a good question. And I think as we they, they explained earlier, it's it has to do with the the, the frontage, the footage, Correct. the foot yeah, frontage. I What's the, that, the, right? Yeah. Uh, and so depending on how basically how wide your lot is and how much frontage you have onto the road. It's, it's assessed based on that. No, I understand yeah. that, but I thought more fairly it would be just shared among all their residents. I, I understand what you're saying. It's, um, I, I think this is, was established initially, um, what, 30 years ago now? Many, many years ago. Uh, the, uh, the assessment policy was established in uh, 1962, and then the PMP has been in place since 1991, so yes, correct. And, and I don't know, I wasn't around in 1962. <laughs> um, I was. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm assuming it probably was trying to balance it out for the you know the the extra wide lots the extra large lots trying to balance it with the, the smaller lots and just trying to make it equitable throughout the community was would be my assumption but I, I don't know that for certain that's just my guess right. I'm just not sure how equitable that is yeah. thank you thank you Anyone else in the chambers wish to speak on this? Mm -hmm. 
No one coming forward? Mr. Brillard, is there anyone else on the phone line? Mayor, no one else waiting uh, to speak on the phone. Uh, are the folks that commented, are they still on the line? I, I just want to make sure that we answer their questions correctly. Uh, indeed, they are. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the last name of, uh, of uh, uh, Brooks and, uh, and the person calling with her. Did, did you have your questions answered? Hey, yeah, um, I feel like it was answered. It's like a civil engineering team assessed our street, and that's how they came to the conclusion that we needed to um, have it redone. So that's fair, in my opinion. So thank you. And my last name was Schooler, S C H O O L E R. Thank Thanks. you for that. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Last call for anyone here in the chambers? Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.7 this evening. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.7 tonight. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, uh, discussion on this or questions? Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick one based on the, the most recent comment that the, the resident made regarding um, equity and how we pay for, for PMP. Um, and I, I think staff can speak to this. Well, I know they can speak to it better than I can. But um, I, I, I think we should be clear that assessments, if I'm correct, only pay for a portion of, of the overall PMP um, project, that there, there are assessments that I'm seeing here um, there, we take out bonds occasionally, which are, are covered by the broader sort of taxpayers in the city of Bloomington. Uh, franchise fee, fees also pay for a portion of it and so on. So um, I think it's, it's just worth remembering that, um, you know, while obviously some residents do pay those um, assessments based on their, their frontage on, on that particular street, that if, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's not even the majority of the cost, if I, I remember correctly. Th thank you for clarifying that, Council Member. That, that's exactly right. The, the, the total assessment is actually 75% is covered by the city, 25% is covered by the homeowner. Am I correct? Correct, exactly. So the total project cost, so this year we're estimating, the estimated cost was $7.3 million for the project before you this evening. Um, above, above that, about 25% would be covered, 20 to 25% through the assessments to the adjacent property owners. The remaining cost of the project would be paid through through citywide funds. So that is correct. And, and when we say citywide funds, that basically then is covered by other residents and businesses within the city. Exactly. Yes. Thank you for that clarification, Councilmember Coulter. I should have brought that up. Councilmember D'Alessandro? I did have something I wanted to ask. Um, if that's all right with you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm, um, I'm curious about um, the, um, the way that we calculate um, what goes into what particular um, uh, area. So like why seal coating is paid for by franchise fees versus not etc is was there a, a particular method to the to that um determination um and has that changed at all or has that been in place for as long as these other programs have been in place in terms of how we are collecting the revenue the, there is a method to the madness and it and i know you didn't um you were going to um and uh and yes it has changed because we haven't been collecting franchise fees for all those 30 years, the 60 years of this program. That's just, that, that's a recent thing. And I'll, I'll turn to staff or, or Mr. Pabrugi, I'm trying to remember all the, the calculation and the rationale went, that went into um, using mm -hmm. franchise fees for the seal coating and more general funds for the, the, the other parts of it. I, I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, forgive me for also not being able to remember the details of the discussion, but it was uh, the apportionment was done back in 2016 when the Council made the decision to move to have franchise fees uh, implemented. So I'm looking at our city engineer uh, who is looking over at our CFO. So everybody. Yeah. This is the one time everybody passes the buck to the CFO, right? To see, they're usually asking the CFO to pass the buck. Is it kind of Scholler? Uh, back in 2016, we did establish the franchise fees, and part of that is we surveyed what other communities are using their franchise fees for, and majority are using it for their payment management program. Initially, it was 
The reconstruction um, is the 25% for, um, as talked about tonight, with, with bonding for the other 75%. And then we have um, the, if I get it right, the overlay is what um, initially came in um, and we were levying taxes for those um, prior to 2016. And um, the seal coating um, came in after that um, as pieces to do with the franchise fees. We also have the trails and the sidewalks and all those pieces now under the franchise fee umbrella. So um, as we watch and look at those numbers and the franchise fee, you know, just give you a heads up, it's coming back to you next summer. Um, so we'll be looking at that again for what it covers, what dollar amounts and where the programs are going with that. But um, it's been since 2016 that it, those three areas, the trails, the overlay, the seal coat, are all um, part of franchise fees and not part of the tax salary. Council, any additional questions? Council Member Lohman? Not really a question, more of a comment. Um, I, I did notice uh, in the um, uh, slides that Edina made a change um, from being 100% uh, to 65%. Um, or if I remember that correctly, and that used to always be my example of when we talk about fairness, um, you know, uh, that the residents in Edina have to pay 100% of that. And so uh, if you had, <laughs> you know, however they did their assessment, you're paying a lot more of it. Um, and so um, I always like to kind of hold that in balance when you look at, so I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on in terms of what their changes that were made there, but 65% uh, uh, still higher than, 25 percent um so yeah and uh, uh mr mayor council member that's a good point so edina is transitioning from a assessment model to a, a fee-based model so they're going to have a fee for their residents so as that fee comes online they are reducing the amount of the assessments so that um, if you are assessed for a project when that fee goes those live so they're still capturing those dollars they're just doing it in a different format so um, those numbers aren't going away they're just transitioning away from their special assessment policy so it's basically it works out to be Roughly the same, or yeah, I don't know what their exact amount is, but they're adding it when they, after it's fully implemented, they'll no longer be assessing for their reconstruction projects, but there'll be a fee that all property owners will pay, regardless of whether or not their street's being reconstructed that year. So, wow, citywide, wow, wow, okay, thanks, council. Any additional discussion on this? <clears throat> Seeing none, council, I would look for action on item 4.7. All right, I'm happy to. Councilmember Lohman. Move a resolution ordering the 2023-101 Pavement Management Program PMP Street Reconstruction Project Street Referencing uh, 1 through 20. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to adopt the resolution ordering the 2023 Pavement Management Program Street Reconstruction Projects. Hearing no further council discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And I will say, I, I understand this is, it's a hardship. I know that it's a lot of money. And I would encourage you to, to con consider looking at the hardship option uh, as you move forward, uh, if that would be a possibility, or even the 10-year deferment to pay it over 10 years as opposed to all up front, because yes, it, it is a major cost. I certainly understand that. So thanks for being here this evening. I appreciate it. And thank you, gentlemen. And the team for the uh, the presentation here on, on this this evening. We'll move to item 4.8. Another public hearing, this regarding a tax increment financing for the Oxborough Heights development project. And Mr. Good evening, Mr. Palermo. Schmidt. <laughs> oh, Schmidt. <laughs> I went face blind. <laughs> it's okay, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Palermo was going to present tonight. However, he is home with a sick child, so. My apologies. I'm just I'm killing the names tonight. This is uh this is just great. All right. Good evening, Jason. All right. Um, can we get the PowerPoint, please? All right, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. So tonight I'm here before you, um, looking uh, for a recommendation for approval to create a new tax increment financing uh, district for Oxborough Heights. Uh, just to, to recall, this is a 125-unit multifamily senior affordable housing project. One too far. Um, 
So this project was before the city council for entitlements back on October 3rd, which those entitlements were approved. Um, through this process, we have done the notification requirements for a state statute with regards to creating a TIF district. On November 3rd, the Planning Commission did take action on this item with regards to making sure that the TIF plan was in conformance with the comprehensive plan. And tonight, we are before you for consideration for a public hearing and a recommendation of approval for this TIF district. This property is located just east of Lindale Avenue, uh, north of 93rd Street. It is three existing lots, of, two of them are vacant and one is a non-conforming um, residential house um, at 600 West 93rd Street. And MWF Properties is the developer on this site. As I previously stated, this is a 125 unit senior, care faci senior facility, uh, 55 plus and older. And what has changed uh, since the, uh, this was before you during the entitlement process was the number of deep affordability. Uh, during our negotiations with the developer and with the request with the TIF and review of their pro forma, we were able to get even deep, a larger number of the deeper affordability than what they had initially proposed. Um, they were at three units at the 30% AMI. We were able to get nine units at the 30% AMI uh, for this project. Additionally, we were also able to secure 23 units at the 50% AMI uh, to really reach our, our deep affordability requirement that is within our comprehensive plan and part of our requirement with Met Council. The remaining uh, units are then a mixture between the 60% AMI and a new category, 70% AMI. Uh, these will be the kind of the first 70% uh, AMI units within the city of, of Bloomington. Um, and talking with the developer, um, this is actually a, a unique product because what happens is if a number of those households are at the 60% AMI threshold um, with regards to their income, if they were to get a raise or a second member of that household goes out and gets another part-time job or, or goes to a full-time position, that could put them out of that 60% AMI range and now they have to go straight into a market rate. And that could significantly reduce the num their cash flow um, with which the percentage that's going towards housing. And so this 70% is gonna offer a great uh, product for these seniors um, within that category. And something also interesting with this project is we were able to secure this affordability for 30 years. Um, our housing TIF district is 26 years, our OHO ordinance is 20 years, um, and working with the tax credit program with which this will be under, uh, this will have a security within our development agreement for 30 years. Construction is slated to begin in January of, or excuse me, in 2023, and hopefully opening here in January of 25. Just to give you a quick idea and for the public, um, I just wanted to show this slide as far as what are those rents. This, this is the maximum rents um, that HUD would, would allow for these uh, various units. So $616 per month would be the maximum rent for an efficiency in the 30% AMI, um, and then if you look at it up to 70, in the 70% AMI level, that would be right around 1,400. So kind of getting with the financing consideration. So this project is slated uh, to cost approximately $38.1 million. Um, we are looking, the HRA is looking to, um, to offer them an affordable housing trust fund loan in the amount of $2.125 million at a rate of 3.5%. And how that loan is going to get paid back is through this tax increment financing district. And so the increment that would be coming in from this district would help to cover or pay that loan back to the city. And so overall for the amortization schedule of that uh, loan, that amounts to about $3.27 million with which then this product project would be getting. And like I stated, uh, that would be for that deep affordability as well as supplementing um, this affordability for 30 years. So you've all seen this slide no, numerous times, um, but just a quick overview again of how TIF works. Um, so currently what happens is we capture that pay, base value as far as what the tax is being collected today. So that value before development, that continues to pay taxes to all of the local taxing jurisdictions, the city, the county, school district, and others. The new increment, the but for test, but for this increment, this development would not occur on this site. So that everything that you see in that green triangle, that's the increment that we are collecting at the city, which will go to help pay back that affordable housing trust fund loan. And then 
once this TIF district is terminated, all of that increment, all of the taxes that are paid, then go back to paying all of the tax taxing jurisdictions. And so just to go over some quick state statutes as far as um, why we're here before you um, and to, to know that this project is meeting those state statute requirements. Um, one is this is a housing TIF district. Does it meet the requirements as outlined in statute, which it does. This developer is proposing 60% of the units are going to be for, um, for individuals that are making 60% or lower in AMI. Or another way of looking at it, 25% of these units are gonna be for individuals making 50% or less AMI. They're meeting that state statute requirement. The but for test, but for this assistance, this project would not occur. But for the assistance that we're looking to provide this project, we would not be getting these deep affordable units, the uh, nine at 30%, the 23 at 50%. And so that's where this but test uh, falls into line with this district. Additionally, what's the maximum opportunity and consistency with the project? We have analyzed this development performance, staff has, and we've gone through, negotiated um, with the developer to get that deeper level of affordability, and that is maximizing the opportunity of this site and for this TIF district. And overall, as I stated previously, this uh, TIF district or plan uh, does conform with our comprehensive plan forward 2040. And so, as I previously stated, it's um, in our goal, goal two, um, in our housing plan, it's meeting uh, various new housing types, and then it's also providing affordable housing to serve that local demand. And just to really point out, our Maxfield housing study um, did show that uh, we are, are short uh, affordable senior units, 193 units in the deep level and 537 in the shallow. So there is a need in the city of Bloomington uh, for these units. So calendar of the next event. So if it, uh, you guys do recommend approval of this uh, TIF plan, uh, tomorrow night the HRA will be acting on, acting and reviewing on the TIF district, uh, the development agreement, and that proposal of the affordable housing trust fund loan. Um, additionally, on November 28th, the city council will have another item related uh, to this project, um, which is our revolving loan fund. And so at that point, uh, there would be a request to approve a resolution for our fourth and final draw of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund loan, um, which is an agreement that is between the HRA and the City Council. And our CFO uh, will explain that um, on the November 28th meeting. And so with that, uh, this is a public hearing, uh, but we do have a motion here um, with which we would look uh, for approval. And with that, I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Appreciate it. <laughs> Council, any questions here? Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so very excited about this project and amazing work on the part of staff to do this, have these negotiations and get to such a deep level of affordability, which we know we've been struggling with. Um, so I think most people living in Bloomington and who are listening tonight probably understand that we need to have affordable options, particularly for seniors as they age and they're living on fixed incomes and often at lower incomes. But I still think it's important to talk about what AMI is and what is like what is AMI and what would like 50% AMI actually be in terms of an income for somebody? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Carter, great question. Um, and I'm lucky I have notes in front of me uh, <laughs> with regards to that. Uh, so currently in, 2000, in 2022, our area median income um, for our Twin Cities metropolitan area, as far as what a family of four typically, or the area median would, uh, is making, is $118,200. So that's the area median income. For a family that is at the 50% area median income, that's right around $58,000. Um, for someone that's at the 30%, that's right around the 33 to 34,000. Uh, someone at the 60% is right around the 70,000, and the 70% is just shy of 82,000. Thank you. I just, every time I hear those numbers, I'm still like amazed that that's what we, I mean, that's affordable housing at this point, but I think a lot of people in our community um, would be very happy to be making 70 or 80, 60, 70, 80,000. And like the mayor has said before, that's teachers, that's police officers, that's, and of course we're talking about senior affordable housing here. Um, so even for a lot of seniors, this is still gonna be a lot of money. So I um, just wanted to emphasize that because I know sometimes we get, you know, pushback from some community members about, 
you know, investing in affordable housing in our community, but um, just want to be clear what we're talking about here. So thank you. Um, I don't think I have any other questions right now. Thank you, Council Member. And yes, you're exactly right. I'm glad you brought that up. This is, um, yes, it's affordable housing. What it is, it's housing that people can afford to stay in our community. Yep. Council Member Nelson. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick comment. I don't think I actually have a question, but I just wanted to thank staff. Uh, when this came before us for the entitlements, I pushed back a little bit on the TIF part of it, and um, I am really glad to see more deeper affordability um, and I appreciate the information in your presentation about the need and how we're doing with regards to senior affordable because we know we're hitting that 80% AMI overall but it's been the deep affordable and then to see the numbers for the seniors that's what I needed to see tonight and I appreciate that you guys followed up on that um, you know the reality is, is we have a lot of seniors we, we hear from people all the time that you know it's just, it's it's hard to make ends meet and, and things like that we need to provide options for them because they want to stay in the community and um, this is a good project to do that so um, yeah, thank you for addressing those concerns and working with the developer to, to address those concerns I appreciate that Mr. Mayor, can I say something? Please. Um, something I would like to, to just add is, so MWF Properties is the developer working on this, Chris Stoka, he may be online as well. Um, we, when he came in with, with this request, we informed him what our, the demand was with the city. We were looking for that deeper affordability. And when we initially reviewed it, um, we worked in, we got up to five units. He went to his lender and worked with them, was able to adjust some terms, and came back and said, I can do better, I can get us to nine. That is a great partnership, and I just wanted to really highlight that um, on behalf of, from the city to the developer. Mr. Stoka, anything to add? Thank you much for your work on this. Nothing to add. Um... Thank you for this time, and uh, we're really excited for this project. As are we. As are we. Looking forward to it. Councilmember Nelson with a question? Um, yeah, actually, I do have a question here, just to make sure I understand it right, because this is a little bit different than other TIF funds. So the TIF will go to pay back the housing trust fund, as opposed to paying someone privately or anything like that, that's going to come back to the city to be used for other projects in the future. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Because that seems like a huge win for the city as well. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, that is correct. It will be coming back to the HRA for the HRA to pay off the loan that they have for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, but the HRA's loan with the private bank that we have is at a lower rate, so there is an interest amount um, that we will be getting as well, which will go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund which hopefully we can then stick into future projects. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if this is a question that can be answered, uh, but I'm just kind of curious, how does the, do we have, do we have any, um, as, an, as the HRA, do we have any uh, responsibility and or, um, um, I don't know, authority, I don't know what the right word is, uh, to, to influence um, the actual renting of these things, or is that just a market condition? Like, we're, we're not involved, am I correct, in placing people in these apartments or anything like that as a result of, of our involvement in its construction? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro, um, as part of our Opportunity Housing Ordinance and a part of the Affordable Housing Plan, uh, the developer has prepared an affirmative marketing tool, which we have reviewed as far as who are they targeting, how are they targeting uh, that population, um, to make sure that they're getting the word out that these uh, units are available. And so we are part of that, but as far as like the negotiations of who's renting, um, we, are, we are not involved in that process. But I do think we have statistics on senior facilities in the city of Bloomington typically rent primarily to seniors in Bloomington. Is that correct? Mr. Mayor, I am not sure. Or did I just make that up? I thought I had heard that at one point. <laughs> I'm <Great> talking. <laughs> Mr. Markegaard, can you confirm or deny that? Yeah, Mayor Boise, uh, what we've heard anecdotally from a lot of developers is that 
with a senior project, approximately half of the units go to uh, Bloomington residents, thereby opening up other opportunities in the city. So I wasn't, I didn't make that up completely. Very good. Okay, good. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mark. You. You're good. <laughs> Council, any additional questions? Thank you. This uh, item 4.8 is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing now. This is the tax increment financing for the Oxborough Heights development project. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.8? Anyone on our phone lines, Mr. Brillert? Uh, Mayor, no one on the phone for this item. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Council, no one coming forward, no one on the phone. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Carter to close the public hearing on item 4.8 this evening. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries 7-0. Council, any additional questions or comments on this? I will say I'm excited for this project. I think this is a, this is a, a needed project, and, I, and I'm uh, enthused by where it's going to be and the infill development that it's going to provide and the creativity that went into it to, to reach some of those lower levels is, is impressive. So well done on this. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to echo uh, Councilmember Nelson's comments about the work related to uh, deeper affordability with regards to TIF. That's, I know that's something that I've commented on in the past as well. If there is nothing else, I'm happy to make a motion. Councilmember Coulter. Anyone else? Uh, Mayor, I will move to adopt a resolution approving the Oxborough Heights redevelopment project area and the redevelopment plan and establishing the Oxborough Heights Tax Increment Financing Housing District and approving its Tax Increment Financing Plan. Second. Motion by Councilmember Coulter, second by Councilmember Carter to adopt the resolution approving the Oxborough Heights Redevelopment Project Area and TIF Plan. No further questions, no further comments by the Council? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. Thank you much on this project. Well done. Item 4.9, we're getting there, folks. Item 4.9, uh, our next public hearing, this is a resolution to approve the issuance of multifamily housing revenue notes for the benefit of the Oxborough Heights Limited Partnership. Ms. Economy Scholler. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, as we just finished up with, with the last item, um, this is part of the major funding of the facilities. This is asking for authorization of um, housing revenue notes. So the City Council did approve on June 13th and July 18th uh, resolutions authorizing submission of an application for to the Office of Minnesota Management and Budget for an allocation. August 1st, they received an allocation of 19500000 So tonight is authorization um, by council, a, a public hearing and authorization to issue those bonds. Um, those notes um, would be issued, um, and so it's a conduit bond type of issue, so it's only payable from the res revenues pledged. It is not any sort of obligation of the city. Um, it does not, con it's not constituted as a debt of the city um, or a statutory levy limit or any part of that. It, um, so it's not a general or moral obligation of the city um, and no one can come after the city to pay these bonds. So a uh, conduit bond deal. And again, it's for the 125 senior housing units. So. The questions of Ms. Include, Economy Scholler on this. Yeah, it would include um, approving a housing program along with authorizing, um, executing related, related documents. So um, Julie Eddington, our bond attorney, is the one working on this portion of the activities. Very good. Questions, Council? Very good. And, and to clarify, this is the city of Bloomington is simply the conduit, simply the issuer, but yes. there's no responsibility or any kind of, it, it's not going to come back to the city in any way, shape, or form, simply the conduit, correct? Correct. Thank you. The city will not pay one dime of these bonds. <laughs> Item 4.9 is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing now. This is a resolution to adopt the issuance of multifamily housing revenue notes for the benefit of Oxborough Heights Limited Partnership. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to Item 4.9 this evening? No one coming forward. Mr. Brillard, anyone on the phone? Mayor, no one on the phone for this item. Last call on item 4.9.
Council, no one on the phone, no one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to close the public hearing on tonight's item 4.9. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, any further questions or discussion on this? If not, I would look for action. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I move to approve a resolution authorizing the issuance of multi-family housing revenue notes for the benefit of Oxborough Heights Limited Partnership, approving a housing program and authorizing the execution of related documents. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance of multi-family housing revenue notes for Oxborough Heights. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. And our final public hearing of the evening, item 4.10. This is a public hearing regarding the vacation of public drainage, utility, and access easements located at 600 West 93rd Street and 9216 Garfield Circle. Mr. Keel. Mayor Council, this is uh, part of a replatting process, a, a very routine item. Uh, so all the easements that are being released will be rededicated as part of the new plat. We're recommending approval. Questions of Mr. Keel on this? Pretty routine and straightforward, I think, on this one. No questions? This is a public hearing. I will open the public hearing on item 4.10 regarding the vacation of public drainage utility and access easements, 600 West 93rd and 9216 Garfield Circle. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak on this? Mr. Brillard, anyone on the phone? Mayor, no one on the phone for this item. No one coming forward in the council chambers? No one on the phone. Council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.10. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council, unless there's any questions on this routine motion, I'd look for action. I can move. Councilmember Martin. Uh, Mayor, I will move that we adopt an ordinance approving the vacation of a public drainage, utility, and access easements within Lot 1, Block 1, Colonial Car Wash, 1st Edition, Lot 2, Block 1, Colonial Car Wash, 2nd Edition, and Outlot A, Danko Edition. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to approve the vacation of the utilities and easements as described in the area as described by Councilmember Martin. <laughs> no further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Good work on the, on, the, on the 10 public hearings or so. Well done. Thank you. Thank you to the staff. Thanks to the council. <laughs> Moving on to our number five, our organizational business and our item 5.1, which is an update on Minnesota USA Expo 2027. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this evening we want to do uh, three things. One, we just want to uh, talk a little bit about Expo for folks in the community who perhaps have not uh, heard of it or are not familiar with what it is. Uh, second, uh, we want to provide an update on where we are in that process. And then third, we want to talk about a, a really important component of um, the expo uh, planning process uh, and how it relates to a key strategic uh, initiative and concern of the city and that's in the area of sustainability. So I'll, I'll cover uh, the first two items and then with us uh, this evening is David Lair who is a senior advisor to Minnesota USA Expo 2027 uh, and the chief architect on this project as well. So uh, let's jump into it. So what is Expo 2027? Um, to use a more familiar phrase, it is a World's Fair. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to remind people that, uh, yes, they still do World's Fairs. Uh, if folks are wondering uh, whether they have uh, stopped doing them or not, you may think that only because we have not had a World's Fair in North America since 1986 in Vancouver and in the United States since 1984 in New Orleans. Uh, so these continue to be uh, very, um, uh, exciting and um, uh, draw these exciting events and they draw a lot of people uh, they're held on a regular schedule it's just they haven't happened in the United States recently so about a dozen years ago a group of uh, Minnesota civic leaders got together and said you know uh, we should pursue this World Fair idea and it has developed uh, over the last decade 
uh, so that it is a real possibility now that the uh, World's Fair or Expo will return to the United States and that Minnesota is the place where that would happen. And Bloomington is working with the Expo Committee to be the host silly city uh, if indeed it comes to Minnesota. Uh, so interestingly, we were advised by uh, folks from uh, the organization that decides where these events happen, that we should continue to use the phrase World's Fair. Even though in the rest of the world they refer to them as Expo, they said, you know, the history in the United States is such that you want to use um, language that is uh, understood in common uh, for the people in the United States just to generate awareness and enthusiasm. Uh, so what is it about the World's Fair as well? As you can see from the image here, uh, World's Fairs uh, are associated with uh, some tremendous uh, historical legacy pieces or architectural legacy pieces in the places with the, where they're held. So in the United States, in Seattle 1962, you see the Space Needle. Uh, the, uh, the Ferris Wheel was first unveiled at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. If you've read The uh, Devil in the White City by Eric Larson, you might uh, know a lot more about that uh, World's Fair. And uh, you see the Eiffel Tower pictured there as well uh, as the globe that's in uh, New York from 1964. If you visited San Antonio and uh, walked the River Walk, that is a legacy of the 1968 hemisphere, I believe. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the, the World's Fairs are renowned for having some uh, tremendous legacy and leave behind, and, and it varies from World's Fair to World's Fair what that is. Uh, so what is Expo 2027? Well, first, I just want to share that there are two different kinds of expos primarily. There's an international expo, uh, which you see on the right, the most recent one of those. And those are the ones that are more akin to the World's Fair, as people understand them. Uh, they are a longer event, six months in duration. They can be as large from a, a square, uh, square foot, uh, square acreage is what I'm looking for, from an acreage uh, footprint as the host country wants them to be. So for example, in Dubai, it was about 1,100 acres, which if you're trying to visualize in your mind what that is, it's about 600 football fields. It was a, an immense site. Uh, most of the um, international expos are about half that size. Um, and then in the, and, and so international expos actually happen every five years. They happen on years ending in zeros and fives. Um, so 2020, uh, Dubai was actually held in 2021. It was delayed a year because of the pandemic. Prior to that, it was 2015 in Milan and 2010 in Shanghai. The next uh, international expo will be in Osaka, Japan, which is actually interesting because Bloomington's sister city, Izumi City, is a suburb of Osaka. So it's nice to have that reference. Uh, in between, the international expos on the zeros and the fives happens the specialized expo. Specialized Expo is a shorter duration and more compact site. It is three months long as opposed to six months, and it can be no larger than 62 acres. So you see an image here from Kazakhstan in 2017. Um, prior to that, Yosu, Korea in 2012. There was uh, scheduled to be a specialized expo in 2023 in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and uh, they ultimately decided not to go ahead with that because of the financial uh, impact of COVID and their inability to plan for um, the expo. So there will be no specialized expo in 2023. And I just want to point out that the specialized expo is the variant of expo that the United States and Minnesota are currently bidding to host. So who makes the decision about where expos go? Well, it's this group. It is the Bureau of International Expositions. Uh, they are a treaty organization based in Paris, France. Uh, they have around 170 member countries. They do their work through General Assembly, which meets twice a year. And then they have a committee structure uh, that funnels work uh, in between those General Assemblies. Uh, this is the organization that lays out the process uh, for how, a, how the countries that host are selected. They have very specific criteria ranging from uh, everything from uh, wanting to know what community support exists, wanting to have a solid financial plan, wanting to understand the site and site development, uh, wanting to understand the legacy. And then they send out an executive committee to evaluate each of the candidate countries. 
um, so that they can meet people on the ground, view the site, uh, and basically assess the viability of the proposals, at which point when they complete that work, they will go back to the General Assembly and make recommendations about whether those uh, candidate countries should proceed to um, final consideration. In Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota USA Expo 2027 organization has chosen a theme of healthy people, healthy planet, wellness and well-being for all. Uh, this theme is uh, has been chosen for a couple of reasons. First of all, Minnesota and the Twin Cities especially has one of the strongest concentrations of, um, of health and medical ecosystems in the entire world. Uh, you may be familiar with Medical Alley, which is an industry trade association representing, I believe, more than 500 companies that work in the med tech device uh, and development um, uh, supply chain. Uh, and then we have world-leading research that is being done at the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic and other places uh, in the private companies as well. Uh, the, the largest insurer in the country, United Health Group, is based in Minnesota. Uh, and we have um, world-leading, uh, uh, like I said, world-leading research, but we also have nation-leading uh, indicators of health that occur in Minnesota too. Um, we, you know, we rank very highly in quality of life. We rank highly in things like longevity of life. Um, so all of those sort of uh, position us to um, coalesce around this idea of health and wellness is a really important topic that we can highlight what Minnesota is doing and have a discussion about uh, an issue that is very relevant and important for the rest of the world. As a matter of fact, if you look in the upper right of this slide, the O in Expo, uh, that is derivative of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, that's the logo for the Sustainable Development Goals. And SDG number three is all about um, health of people around the world. Uh, we in the United States don't um, associate as closely with the work of the United Nations, but for other countries around the world, uh, these sustainable development goals are really important. And so having a theme that resonates with other countries is really important for the United States. And I do wanna make a note too, um, that the Minnesota USA Expo 2027 organization is a completely independent uh, organization from the city. It is a 501c6 uh, nonprofit organization. They have their own board structure, which I'll show you momentarily. Um, the, the mayor and I sit on the board of that organization, um, but we do not uh, have a financial commitment to that organization. Make sure, yep, okay, so just real quick history on this. Um, the Minnesota and the United States have been pursuing Expo for several years now, starting back in about 2015 uh, with the formal process in 2016 uh, where President Obama's administration signed off on Minnesota being uh, the U.S. candidate. In 2017, uh, Representative Tom Emmer, Minnesota's 6th District Republican, and uh, U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, Democrat, led the efforts in their respective bodies to uh, have the United States rejoin the Bureau of International Expositions. We had been absent from that organization uh, for about 25 years after withdrawing in the 90s. Uh, so it was really important for the United States to rejoin if uh, the U.S. wanted to be a host of future events. And uh, Representative Emmer and Senator Klobuchar really uh, took up the, the uh, lead and the charge on that. They had support from um, other delegations around the country. Um, Texas delegation was very interested. That's a, a very strong Republican uh, delegation. The California delegation was very engaged. It's a very strong Democratic delegation. Um, and as you can see by the timeline here, uh, as we've gone through this process that uh, 2017, President Trump signed the bill to re-enter the BIE. His administration was very supportive of the effort uh, that was put forward five years ago. And then again with President Biden and his administration supporting the most recent effort, um, this has strong bipartisan support uh, at the federal level. And this is just a quick slide about that board structure for the, the local bid committee. Uh, they have a very well respected and very competent uh, leadership team, uh, both at the, at the staff and the board level. Um, a lot of experience in terms of these kinds of efforts, uh, very well structured uh, and like I said, highly regarded. 
A couple of numbers. Uh, like I said, it's a three-month event. That's 93 days. If uh, the United States and Minnesota host, it will begin on May 15th of 2027 and conclude on August 15th of 2027, so as not to fear, interfere with the with the Minnesota State Fair because uh, we certainly do not want to interfere with that event. Uh, like I said, a maximum of 62 acres. One of the things about the specialized expos that's interesting is how um, they can maximize a very compact site and demonstrate um, uh, some issues around sustainability uh, and um, you know the thought that goes into uh, compact development. And uh, in our case, the site is actually even uh, less than 62 acres. So we're going to demonstrate how you can do um, significant development in a compact uh, and environmentally sensitive way. Uh, about 14.3 million visits. Uh, that is not unique visitors. Um, that is the total number of visits. The vast majority of those visits will likely come from people within this region. And by the region, I mean about the one day drive around the Twin Cities metropolitan area. So if you can envision that, it's everything from Winnipeg to the north to like Kansas City, St. Louis to the south, and Denver, Detroit to the west and the east. Uh, about a billion global views are expected. Uh, there's a real um, forethought that this will be a, a very engaged digital event. So even if people are not able to travel to the United States to participate or to visit, that they will still have opportunities to benefit from the programming that happens at Expo, uh, no matter where they are in the world. And then the economic impact of over um, $2 billion uh, in Minnesota and nationally. And um, I do want to uh, point out that the numbers on visitorship and uh, economic impact uh, were numbers that were um, validated by independent third-party organizations um, outside of the bid committee. So there is uh, there are groups like Rockport Analytics and um, some brand management firms like Legacy that are looking at these things uh, and validating those numbers. Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers uh, is an auditing firm that actually looked at it. Uh, in advance of the, um, of the visit by the executive committee to make sure that these numbers were good and they validated them as well. So again, about 14.3 million visits, about 90% coming from outside um, uh, this area. Uh, and then 33,000 jobs created, that's uh, full supply chain, so it's not just Minnesota, that includes the United States. And then for each of the non-resident visitors, it's anticipated that they will generate about $100 of uh, taxes at the, at the local, state, and federal level. Um, so that's the type of um, revenue that we can expect from visitorship. I stalled out here for a second. There we go. All right, so this is the location. Uh, folks will hopefully recognize the Mall of America in the left center of this picture. Um, and I do want to note that uh, there are a couple buildings on here um, that are in the planning phase that don't actually exist yet. So just north of Mall of America, you see the water park and the hotel and parking ramp next to it, and then some additional development um, just east of Ikea. Um, we recognize those buildings aren't there yet, but uh, especially with the water park, there's an you know, agreement already in place to move forward. So you see the, the site for the expo here is east of Mall of America. The core site is what we call the adjacent lands. It's the 30-acre vacant parcel uh, just north of Old Shakopee Road. Uh, and that is the core site that is then connected by an elevated um, parkway that goes over 24th up to the site on the north uh, uh, there that is at 494 and 24th. That's the former Ramada Hotel, and before the Ramada it was the Thunderbird. The Bloomington Port Authority owns that site. We acquired it back in 2016. We also have a purchase agreement in place for the core site uh, on the adjacent lands. Uh, when you add the total of those two parcels along with the elevated parkway, the total acreage for the proposed site is about 50 acres. And uh, here is just another view of the site itself. Uh, just from a little bit of a different angle looking southeast. Uh, you'll note at the center of the core site, that would be the host United States Pavilion. 
uh, one of the signature architectural features, and then the pavilion buildings for the other participating countries uh, around the perimeter of that site. And now I want to talk about some uh, ideas related to sustainability, because I know that this is uh, an issue that's important to the City Council, it's important to our Sustainability Commission, and frankly have heard questions from residents about uh, what an event of this uh, scale uh, may mean from an environmental impact. And so David Lair from uh, DLR is going to talk about uh, how sustainability is being incorporated uh, into the plan for Expo. David, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Jamie, Mayor and Council members. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Really appreciate talking about this. And um, it's been a little bit of a passion of mine. I call it my side hustle for over a decade. So uh, it's good to be at this point on the process. As Jamie mentioned and did a terrific overview of the whole planning process, our expo activity is um, at a stage in which we have presented our bid application. Sometimes it's called a dossier. There's 14 specific criteria, as Jamie had mentioned, that they review and evaluate on us, including the site proposal that uh, Jamie just gave a high level overview of. And um, uh, in addition, um, they last month, uh, a group called an inquiry mission from the Bureau of International Expositions came to Minnesota and they kicked the tires. They vetted the application. So they spent three days in Minnesota. They spent two days in Washington, DC. And um, we had the opportunity to take delegates, um, ambassadors from France, Bangladesh, Morocco, and El Salvador, plus three of the top BIE officials from Italy, from um, UK, and um, we took them on to site. We actually took them out on the site that we proposed, and they were very impressed with what we're doing. So um, our sustainability discussion here is really our first start at it, and we look forward to having the conversation with the Sustainability Commission on how we develop a further, deeper sustainability plan for the Expo. It's pretty rare to be at the very front end and to be able to define what the requirements are and the criteria are for sustainability, and that's the point uh, at which we are. We haven't won the project yet. That comes with a vote in June of 2023, but we have some time, some runway here of time to be able to develop our sustainability plan and kind of work through it. So what the slides I'll share with you tonight are really from our inquiry mission, our sort of first uh, oar in the water, if you will, of sustainability for the expo and highlight our general approach and how we're um, looking at sustainability for the expo. Um, our plan is to present a world-class groundbreaking, never before, net zero energy expo. And we're very passionate about how to do that. We have uh, very specific details on how we might achieve that. We'll kind of share those, those elements with you tonight. We have a little bit of um, homework to do on a number of fronts on how to achieve all those elements, but we're very confident that we can um, set the stage for expos forever and use Bloomington as the first of its kind. So with that, the slide on the screen is really some of our core elements about uh, looking at what South Loop has already established. Jamie had mentioned, you know, there's a lot of um, infrastructure already in place. So we're not trying to expend additional resources on new infrastructure. We're looking at the transit system, uh, looking at the utilities, uh, looking at those kinds of infrastructure elements to, be, to build upon as a core element. We're looking at um, also that these are brownfield sites with very little vegetation on them to start with. So we can really raise a bar and a few elements right from the get-go. The other piece is to look at international standards like ISO standards and developing metrics and these kinds of standards for how the expo might be designed, how it might be constructed, how it might be operated, and what do we leave in place for a long-term legacy. And lastly, we're very committed in establishing um, the right kind of habitat, restoring the ecosystems, and looking forward to uh, creating a, le leaving the place much better than what it exists today. Some of our kind of fundamental thinking goes to a cradle to cradle concept, and you'll see a sort of a diagram later in these slides about how it's kind of circular, how we use materials, we use elements that can be reused and reused and reused again, 
without it being disposed of. In fact, we don't think of anything as waste. Our plan, in addition to be a net zero energy, our goal is to have a net zero waste expo event in which we look at waste as a source of fuel or a source of energy or a source of new uh, material. And we look at uh, long way, long-term ways of making this a very equitable condition in the city as well. We know that has a, a special place in the community, but in a broader regional aspect, it becomes a kind of a centerpiece for how, how to do events like this, how to take uh, a 50 acre site and turn it into a showcase on a global level. So our design team really kind of um, uh, focused and used this term quite a bit in our planning work. We think of the expo as something that might occur only once in somebody's lifetime. Um, going to some of these expos and taking delegations from Minnesota to, for example, to Milan, uh, people are waiting in line for six hours to go to the Japanese pavilion. And I asked somebody in line about that, and they said, well, I'll never get to Japan, but I'm willing to wait six hours in line to visit this uh, pavilion. So it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience for many people who will come here. But our what we looked at is that it should be a lifetime experience without a lifetime of negative effects. It's a really powerful thing that we are focused on as a design team, as architects, as designers, as planners, to not to have any negative effects for this project. We look at things like the 2030 challenge about um, um, not having any new um, carbon emissions from this project. And uh, so 2027, the uh, expo may be done, but this will kind of shape the course of South Loop for generations to come. So how, how can we set that in motion as well? Some of the work and some of the groundwork in South Loop is already there. It always amazes me that, you know, here it is about 25 degrees outside tonight, and there is no central heating at the Mall of America. There's not, the heat source is people, or it's uh, lights, it's equipment, and uh, solar gain from some of the sunlight, or, uh, um, some of the um, overhead lights. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things to be said about how to look at some of those models, but it's only a starting point. And so we recognize that there's, you know, a big facility that has about 40 million people a year that come through there. Uh, we can do better for an expo and kind of take that and ratchet it up a level. So as, um, as architects, we look at a few things. You know, it's easy for us to think about design, and we're in the very early stages of design for this project overall. And we start to set in motion a few of the elements, but it wouldn't occur if we don't also follow through on the operations and on the construction side. So we want to make sure that what gets built is um, consistent with the sustainable metrics. What gets uh, operated uh, is operated in a sustainable manner. And so we look at this kind of circle of activity that goes on in the expo site and have, um, I can elaborate on any of these uh, kind of details and I have a summary chart on this as well. One of the elements we're really looking at is how to design and build facilities for accommodating uh, 14 million visits over a 93-day plan without burdening the site long-term. So, you know, as we look at it, there's no need to build the 15,000 restrooms that are gonna be required day one and make them permanent. So there, we're looking at some temporary buildings that can serve the expo itself for that specific purpose. But we also know we wanna build long-lasting buildings that are iconic and suit and uh, elevate the city of Bloomington itself, but uh, fit for the expo. And we're looking at um, ways and techniques in the construction and the design process like using timber frame construction. Timber frame is a popular construction methodology right now. In fact, uh, my firm, DLR Group, has done the largest number of timber frame buildings in the US. We have 22 projects under design and construction. The first one was the T3 project in the North Loop in Minneapolis. And uh, we have others that are uh, finished and under construction as we speak. And we know that there are techniques in timber frame that one has embodied energy in the nature of the wood. Two could be seen as ways that we might build buildings for the expo and potentially disassemble those and repurpose those kinds of buildings for future sites. So we're looking at those, all those kind of strategies of techniques, uh, technologies, and ways to move forward on a sustainable plan for the expo.
Um, the third component of our cradle to cradle concept is really how do the people who visit the expo actually participate, actually contribute to this um, experience? How do they actually help make this a more sustainable model? And we know that the, some of the easy things are our uh, products that we know of today that we could put in place, things like uh, kinetic energy capture on having pavers that can capture the footsteps and convert that into energy for the expo. But how do they understand that um, their decisions about um, wrappers and napkins, their decisions about um, how they use electricity um, can all influence how much energy and um, sustainable approaches can be used for the expo itself. So some of this is an educational element, some of it is a, you know, clear directional aspects of it, but we know how important it is from an experiential side to make that part of our design process. This diagram has a lot of different uh, specific techniques. You know, these are more architectural techniques from photovoltaic elements that are found that we look at all surfaces of the building to um, things about um, uh, reusing um, uh, materials on the site to developing uh, green roofs for the project to uh, capturing as much water we can on the site and repurposing that for um, all the different uses on the site to things about um, how people approach. And so it's not just the expo itself as the 14 million visits that occur, but it's also supply chain issues. It's also about uh, thinking about how people arrive. Um, we can't do much about people wanting to get in their car and come here, uh, you know, driving long distances. In fact, you know, it's probably counter to uh, what happens on a sustainability model. Um, one of my first projects I've done in town here, the first LEED certified restaurant in the country is the Red Stag Supper Club in Northeast uh, Minneapolis. And we did surveys after the fact, and we found that people were driving from Duluth and Mankato, and it kind of shot a hole in the sustainability story because people found it to be so popular that they were contributing to greenhouse gas by driving long distances. Well, we may face the same issue here, but there might be some strategies to divert the kind of greenhouse gas emissions by the visitors uh, early on uh, so that we can deflect some of that. And then the last part of this circle of how we think about it from a design point of view is the legacy stuff. So how do we develop the standards for future expos? How do we look at um, the sustainability model as an economic stimulus for other self-loop development? And how do we restore the habitat and have a renewed landscape for the site itself? Um, this chart kind of summarizes the very specific, tangible efforts that were underway with um, our expo planning. It's in three columns. The first column is really about how do we def use defined programs, programs that are already in place, ISO standards for operations, ISO standards for how materials and design comes together, um, the uh, greenhouse gas protocol scope items, how we look at uh, energy use intensity tracking, um, using the UN uh, SDG integration and LEED certification. So those programs are in place, and we'll work with all those programs to develop the right kind of comprehensive viewpoint of uh, sustainability for the Expo. The middle column is really about operational strategies, how to look at everything from food safety and security to community outreach as elements of how the Expo should operate and how it functions and how it has an attitude about it. And in fact, um, in our planning uh, phases of this work, we elevated the notion of a sustainability director or senior level manager into the core management structure of the entire expo operation. So part of the um, plan for the Bureau of International Expositions, part of that criteria was to show what our management approach would be, how that fits with the financial models that we've used, and we made sustainability at the highest level in that organizational structure. And then the last column is really around design and some of the legacy strategies. Those are things that we're a lot more comfortable with or it's things that we know of today that we can um, put in place and look at and have those as parts of the components for um, sustainability. I think that's it for our approach. Um, I'll just say one last uh, element here. You know, part of 
doing projects of this that are world class, part of that, um, that look at um, how to make an imprint in the world and change the trajectory of how people do expos is really about finding the sort of poetry and the kind of stirring the soul element of design. And so a lot of our design work, a lot of the things that uh, Jamie shared with you were really influenced by the, the forces of nature in, in our environment today, how water flows through the site. We thought that was analogous to how people might flow through the site, how water has kind of formed the topography and our connection to the Minnesota River Valley and the Mississippi River. And so, you know, part of it is to also have that kind of front and center and on display. And so if we have, when we play host to the world in 2027, we want to show and feature things like water and have that part of our story as well. So thank you very much. Look forward to your questions. And then Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I'll just do a couple of quick wraps here. Again, this is the uh, U.S. host pavilion that's the centerpiece of the structure. This also gives you an impression of uh, some of the verticality of the site too, as uh, David indicated, um, throughput of a 14 million visits over 90 days means about 150,000 people a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so doing that on a compact site of 50 acres means there's going to have to be uh, really thoughtful design about how people will move uh, and um, how we make sure that they can have a positive uh, experience from a mobility and accessibility perspective. Uh, real quickly, here's the competition. If people are wondering who else is uh, being considered for Expo 2027, uh, San Carlos de Barloche in Argentina, which is on the edge of Patagonia, Phuket, Thailand, Belgrade, Serbia, Malaga, Spain. Uh, they have all been visited by the inquiry mission, the executive committee of the Bureau of International Expositions, and the, the uh, inquiry missions have uh, produced recommendations that each of the five candidates move forward in the process. So that recommendation will be taken up by the General Assembly at their next meeting uh, at the end of November. And uh, as David indicated, uh, the vote will occur at the um, General Assembly meeting in June of 2023. So here's the quick recap on the timeline. David mentioned the dossier submission in June, the inquiry mission last month, the General Assembly coming up, and then uh, in June will be the selection vote. Uh, each each member nation to the uh, 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 to the BIE has one vote, uh, so it's one vote per country. If uh, the United States and Minnesota are selected in June, it will be a 46-month sprint uh, to open the gates. And uh, four years might sound like a lot to some people, uh, but to put that in perspective, uh, you have to have about two years construction phase uh, to make sure that site prep and, and building construction can be complete in time for the countries who are participating to come and build out their pavilions within those structures. Uh, and that means that uh, working here at the city as the, as the host city um, with uh, whomever is fulfilling the role of master developer, uh, those um, agreements and contracts uh, as well as the development pro forma and the, all of the financial aspects of, of the development project will need to be worked out within about an 18-month time frame. So it's going to be uh, a, a pretty intense uh, year and a half before the construction actually gets underway. Uh, real quickly, though, before I close out here, uh, is we want to hit on the... Oh, maybe that was my last slide. Um, I violated one of my own principles, which is you should always start with why, right? So um, the why on this is this, for the, especially for the city of Bloomington. Why does Bloomington want to be the host city uh, for the expo event? And frankly, there are uh, a couple of reasons. Um, the, the, the primary reason is that this is an economic development opportunity uh, that is frankly unparalleled. Uh, as, as the council is aware and uh, many people in the community know, our South Loop District uh, is a very large district which we have been working at intentionally over the last 35 years uh, to continue to develop for generations to come. And uh, there's, not you, there's not often an opportunity to do a 50-acre development that not only is good for the community in terms of adding um, 
uh, high value commercial property, uh, adding space that can be appreciated by the public, uh, being a place where jobs uh, will be and economic activity will occur. Um, but to do it with a signature world recognized development uh, is a unique opportunity. And frankly, uh, there is a certain cachet that comes with being a, a World's Fair or Expo host city. It's a pretty small community, right? And that's, uh, that's from a, an image uh, perspective, uh, something that will um, dramatically benefit the city of Bloomington. Uh, so the, the economic impact of the development has always been the primary consideration for the city of Bloomington. Uh, the fact that we will have uh, tremendous visitorship and then uh, we will be working uh, over the next few months to help define uh, how the legacy of Expo will actually have a benefit to the broader Bloomington community that goes beyond the site itself. And so we're going to work with our Community Outreach and Engagement Division to design an engagement process for Bloomington residents and businesses uh, to provide input in the, into that um, ideation about what does the legacy of Expo mean for the city of Bloomington and how can we do something that everybody in the community will say this event um, was good for the community, not just at the time that it happened, but into the future. So I'll stop there. Thank you, gentlemen. So uh, the one question that I always get, and I think we should at least address here, is uh, the, the, the cost and who's going to pay for all this? And I think we, it would be helpful to talk about, uh, at least from a high level, the notion of the public-private partnership that's been discussed to fund this. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, and, and this is the most frequent question that I get as well. Uh, and it comes with, an, I think, an assumption that there is some uh, great financial risk to the city by participating in this. Okay? So first of all, uh, as I mentioned, there is an independent 501c6 organization that is Minnesota USA Expo 2027. Uh, that group is currently a bid committee. Uh, if the United States and Minnesota are awarded the event, uh, they will have to transition quickly into being a, a host or organizing committee. Um, they have their own um, financial uh, uh, management. They also have their own fundraising apparatus. Uh, they will have their own um, legal uh, structures. So they operate as their own independent body and they will have the financial obligation that goes along with the um, planning and operation of the event. Uh, the financial model that they are utilizing uh, is built primarily on sponsorship and ticket sales, and um, there's a pretty um, heavy expectation on sponsorship, uh, but for an event of this scale that's global in nature, I don't think that anybody uh, at the BIE level, based on the comments that they provided during their inquiry mission, believes that that is not an attainable number. Um, so if the sponsorship and the visitorship holds, uh, the, the um, committee's financial responsibility um, should be more than manageable. And the city doesn't have any liability or obligation from that organization's operation. Now, for the city, the, the risk that comes with the project is, uh, frankly, the development risk. And uh, we have a very refined process here working through our Bloomington Port Authority of negotiating uh, substantial, very complex deals uh, and have been doing so over the last 35 years with the um, safety and security of Bloomington taxpayers at the foundation and uh, thus far uh, that has worked out pretty darn well for the city of Bloomington. Uh, the fact is that the security within those de uh, development contracts is uh, pretty tight. Uh, and I would also um, add that as one of uh, three dozen cities in the country that has a triple, triple A bond rating uh, and one of only two cities that has 50 consecutive years of excellence in financial reporting from the government accountant, uh, the GAO, uh, GAO? GFO, thank you, Government Finance uh, Office, Officers Association. Um, I think that everybody recognizes that there isn't a better financial partner in a project like this than the city of Bloomington based on our history and our reputation and frankly our capacity. Thank you. 
Council Member Loman. Um, <clears throat> I absolutely love what I saw, you know, on that uh, on that in terms of sustainability, but I'm going to be a little bit skeptical because uh, you know when you like like something a lot, you gotta you gotta be you gotta be skeptical about it, because what I, I heard um, the city manager talk about is kind of in a sense almost competing interests. I heard health and wellness is kind of the focus of the uh, the event, but then there's also this piece of sustainability, and I, I mean I'm hot for sustainability, so I, I, I like I like that when I saw that, but um, but when we have this um, shortened construction time that were there, I, I'm just concerned uh, that when we have those two competing interests working against each other, that you know what the original focus of health and wellness, which is you know you know certainly the city is all about that as well you know, is going to win out. And so that's kind of my first question. And my second question is around, you know, since we were talking about doing something that maybe hasn't been done before like this, uh, how much does it cost to do just a normal, you know, expo of, of this caliber? And then what we're looking to try to do here is to try to create a sustainable model here. Well, what's the difference in, in price what we're looking at to try to accomplish that? Uh, you know, those are costs there. The mayor brought that forward, and and, and that's so. Uh, so those are kind of my, you know, we've got those competing ish, uh, interests in in the time frame uh, that you're constrained with, and then secondarily, um, you know, there's a there's a cost that's associated with doing these things in the past, and now we're going to try to do something exciting and new, which I think fits in with what um, you know what you know many of us were gathered here um, you know, to talk about mission and that kind of thing, making a unique. Uh, uh, city. So I'm just, if you could talk a little bit um, about those and those challenges, those two things, I, I would appreciate hearing that because I'm, I'm highly skeptical because I like it too much. Go ahead. Um, Mayor and council members, um, really good questions about kind of diving deep into what things are about. So um, the theme about um, health, uh, wellness, and well being has a couple other taglines, and we use them quite a bit healthy people, healthy planet. And um, when I was chair of the organization, um, I established a health and well-being advisory board led by Dr. Patricia Simmons from the Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Jacob Toller from the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Michael Osterholm from the University of Minnesota. So uh, very esteemed colleagues on the health side. And that group went off and created uh, the core theme development, as well as three sub-themes. One is um, health for me, the second is health for us, and a third is health for the planet. And they each have ways of how we interpret that, but it's a core element of how this expo is designed is to have um, health for the planet as a centerpiece of what, is, uh, what, our, what our intent is. And that's why it was so important to create this um, notion of a, a, a very, I'll call it heavy-handed sustainability overlay in the design. During the inquiry mission, there were two elements that came up. One was um, the chair of the delegation from France was quite impressed that we took the time and explained our sustainability plan. All the slides that you saw here tonight were what we presented to the inquiry mission. And they thought it was a terrific model, something they aspire to. We uh, sought assistance from Dubai in their sustainability modeling. So we kind of incorporated some of their benchmarks and some of their planning work into the work that we've decided to, uh, our mission to go out on. Osaka is not planning this aggressive a sustainability piece. It is aggressive by all accounts, but we think that's where we have to start, to start at that, that place. Um, the second piece was, um, um, you know, as we presented uh, sustainability and the kind of uh, thought process, they were quite struck by what a clean blank slate the site is right now today. Anyone who's had the opportunity to go out on that site, you know, it's uh, there's not even many trees we have to remove. In fact, we intend to, uh, you know, we can we can make uh, large predictions of how many more trees we'll add during the expo site because there's hardly any there to start with. Um, but uh, they saw that opportunity to get going right away. That we had a whole plan about being expo ready. That things like infrastructure, like light rail systems or transit systems, or other ways of how we work, we're already in place. And we do, um, we will plan to employ some of the systems that the state fair currently uses, like the park and ride system, 
or the EMT system and not conflict with that kind of time frame during the expo activity itself. So we presented a plan that was much more expo ready and ready to get going right away without this sort of maybe um, compromises that might occur during that time frame of construction to get ready. Um, the second question about cost is a really tricky one or hard to pinpoint. Um, what I do know of the cost uh, for the Astana um, World's Fair in 2017 was much higher than the Minnesota model that we have right now for a couple of reasons. One is um, it had no infrastructure, had no utilities, had there was nothing there. So they had to build all of that into their model, which was you know a lot of added costs. Some of the other um, expos have had, um, from, from what I can gather, uh, much higher costs involved in their development. Um, they've had different approaches to how they think about the buildings or think about the site or think about their community and the kind of uh, shaping of the community that the expo would occur. And, you know, there's no question that we could increase costs uh, for adding other things, but we don't think that's necessary here in Minnesota. We think that the cost allocation, either on a per square foot basis for the buildings we've talked about, or for the development of the land or other things projected to 2027 from an escalation point of view should be adequate to cover it. Um, and right now at this point, we don't have any uh, budgetary impact or in inputs from both the federal or the state level. And both of those things could actually help alleviate some of the pressures on, on uh, things like sponsorship or some of uh, other aspects. But we will look forward to those kinds of federal and state inputs because they generally bring a high level of sustainability requirements that are, are kind of tied to that kind of funding. So um, unfortunately, there isn't a measurement of like what's this increment for doing more sustainable work. We're going to build it in, and we're going to figure out how to do it, and we're still going to have a, a model that other expos can cover in the future. Additional questions, Council? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks for this. I'm super excited about the prospects here, and um, it seems as though there's a, a fairly far-reaching um, look at innovations. And so I'm curious uh, about um, if you can elaborate a little bit more about maybe what you saw in Dubai or um, what you have found um, in your research uh, so far that has been that might end up being maybe one you know a first of its kind in the United States or in Minnesota or something like that something that you're trying to to bring into here that um, that maybe we as a public haven't seen before if there is anything uh, I'd be curious to hear about it that's go ahead <laughs> Mayor and council members. You're the architect. It's a, it's a really great question about like what's the first of its kind. And there are a number of things. Um, for example, um, we um, shared with the inquiry mission some design sources of design inspiration, including some thin film photovoltaic work. And so this is um, uh, photovoltaic that isn't on the market at this point, but could be in which you can actually see through. So it has some um, transparency to it, but it does allow for buildings on all sides, roof and um, the kind of sides of the buildings, the elevations of the buildings, to actually help generate electricity uh, throughout. And you know that, that kind of technique has not been used before. Um, we know we have this window of time between May and August. And even though it might get a little chilly, um, we want to really explore things like passive heating and cooling um, as uh, instead of relying on mechanical systems for that whole approach. And that hasn't been done before. Um, one of the things we were challenged at during the inquiry mission is that we were pretty adamant. Um, we, um, we were pressed and we were asked by the uh, chair of the inquiry mission about would we insist that all 130 or 150 or how many countries would come here, would we insist that they maintain these high level of sustainable standards? And we said yes. It was like not a question in our mind. Like if they're going to come here, they're going to have high level of sustainability. And so as we invite countries to come here, we can, in their participation agreement, uh, specify having them tell their story about health and well-being, having them outline their story about sustainability, about how they're going to reuse those materials or 
have us provide assistance on how those materials can be reused. So those are things that haven't been done before, but those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, that's really great. I um, I was, I think I mentioned this when we were at the uh, BIE party that was at MIA. You know, nothing like walking up to a a uh, um, a bar and getting a you know single use plastic straw in your thing to show you that we have a long way to go in those areas. So I'm very very glad to hear that you're that we're going to be demanding that as part of the participation or you know and and, and that we'll be there to help people through that. Um, I think that's really great. Thank you. Also, anything additional? Mr. Mayor, if I may, just with a couple of last points, because I know we want to move on with it our is, agenda. It is 10, 10 already. Yeah, I realize Rudy. that. So two <laughs> quick notes. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about the money. I think that's the one that most naturally occurs to people. Uh, two other ones that I get a lot. One is, uh, boy, this, this traffic is going to be terrible for three months, right? Um, and, and so here's what I ask people to think about is uh, envisioning the busiest day of the year in that part of town is coming up soon, as a matter of fact, right? It's the day after Thanksgiving. Um, and I think the Saturday before Christmas tends to rival the day after Thanksgiving in terms of the amount of traffic and the number of humans that are out at Mall of America. And the area is designed for the intensity of traffic that it accommodates, right? Between 77 and 494, and then the road system in the South Loop area and the parking ramps. Um, that worst day scenario uh, very rarely, if ever, that I'm aware of, spills into neighborhoods, right? So it may, it may create some traffic congestion around the district itself, but in terms of having a spillover effect into communities, we don't see that. And then the uh, second thing, well, and I would also emphasize what David said, that uh, similar to how the state fair operates with park and ride and shuttles, we also have transit that literally has a stop right across the street from the front door. Uh, we have parking ramps, and we also have 47 hotels with almost 10,000 rooms, almost all of which have a shuttle that runs from their property to either the Mall of America, or in this case, it will be right to the event itself. So uh, then combine the fact that the, the time of the event will be, uh, hours will probably be like 10 a.m. to 10, 9 or 10 p.m., so much of the traffic will be off-peak traffic. Okay? So all of those things suggest that this is a manageable traffic event. And then uh, the issue of safety and crime, right? We hear people saying, my goodness, you're going to have all these people coming in from outside. It's going to be terrible. Um, this event will have a national security de uh, designation from the federal government because of the, uh, the number of dignitaries and high-level government officials from countries around the world that are always here. That means the full resources of the federal government uh, will be brought to bear. That's the... Um, you know, the Homeland Security, uh, the FBI, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA actually has re regulatory authority over these types of events for food safety. Um, so all of those um, resources will be made available. Uh, I'm pretty confident with the, the level of security that's necessary for an event like this uh, that the crime that people are worried about is uh, not going to be significant. And I have not heard that crime has been an issue at any of the previous expos that I've either visited or I'm familiar with. So. Yeah, thank you for those two clarifications. It's good points. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fabri. Thank you. Mr. Lair, good to see you again, David. Yeah. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Item 5.2 on our agenda is Transitional Industrial Zoning District and a resolution to initiate zoning. I'm going to start a timer <laughs> because I want to get done before the sun comes up. It's going on. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. Yes, we have a study session tonight considering a proposal for a new transitional industrial zoning district 
um, for parcels um, on the east side of Lindale between 86th and, or mostly along the east side of Lindale uh, between 86th and 92nd uh, streets. Those lots are all zoned I-3, that's the general industry, uh, general industry zoning district, and there's 28 lots in total to be considered. Uh, some background, uh, the impetus for this project was the uh, Lindale Avenue suburban retrofit plan that was approved last year in April. Um, a couple of uh, relevant guiding principles that were that informed the plan were recognizing that Lindale Avenue is Bloomington's main street. And then there was another principle of creating a compact critical mass of housing jobs and services in designated nodes and 86th Street in Lindale was considered a significant node that in uh, 98th. Um, and another conclusion that came out of the uh, the, uh, the planning document was that the zoning of the lots under consideration need to be reconsidered if you want to in implement the vision laid out in the plan. And that's what this uh, contributes to. Uh, the subject area, uh, again, is highlighted to the, um, on those graphics uh, on the right side. As I said, they're currently zo uh, zoned I-3. They're guided industrial, and that'll um, play into uh, some slides that I have uh, later in the presentation. And um, they're considered a transitional area uh, in the 2040 comp plan. That means that um, indus industrial industry should still continue on those prop, uh, parcels, but they can, that use can be reconsidered if uh, a new use is in line with the goals and policies of the city. Um, something to consider is that uh, the, with, uh, for those lots that are zoned uh, or, or guided industrial, unrelated retail and residential is not allowed, so that's something that needs to be remedied in the comp plan. I'll talk about that later. And something also to highlight is that the, um, the area under consideration is very audio oriented in character, so that poses some challenges as it relates to the uh, retrofit plan. Here's a, uh, a view looking at it uh, toward the east. It's kind of a bird's eye view, but you can actually see some of those auto oriented characteristics, um, uh, drive aisles and parking fronting on buildings. It's a, uh, you know, Lindale is very wide, but this doesn't consider that, but nonetheless, it recognizes the auto-oriented nature um, facilitated by Lindale Avenue and the site design within the area. Uh, recommendations uh, or recommended uh, standards for this uh, zoning district relied uh, partly on engagement and outcomes from that retrofit plan, but uh, staff also did some engagement uh, as part of this uh, project process. Um, we, uh, staff at the outset, uh, selected consult consult as the appropriate participation level. And with that in mind, we did some engagement activities. We did door knocking in early October. The following week, we had two open houses, one in person and one virtual, and we had some engagement. So we were able to meet some building owners and business owners as well. And uh, we had a really good conversation from those activities. So really appreciated that. Um, with uh, all that uh, input in mind, we wanted to make sure that the the uh, the district was moving toward the Lindale or the retrofit vision that you see in that plan, and uh, so this table kind of compares. It's it's a it's a rudimentary comparison between I three and what's established in the in the retrofit plan, and it looks at setbacks, intensity, residential. You know, Lindale vision uh, wants uh, buildings closer to the sidewalk and to the street to um, uh, establish that intimacy that also contributes to a pedest uh, pedestrian family environment, uh, more intense use of land, so uh, uh, more activity um, that will come with a more variety of uses, although there is a lot of uses already allowed within the I-3, so we also wanted to maintain that attribute because it's uh, considered an advantage. And then it's going to encourage resident or allow residential, which is not currently allowed, and again, that's something that's part of the uh, retrofit plan that we incorporated into this draft of this new zoning district. So with that, um, uh, we started looking at all aspects of what makes up the zoning district. And uh, you'll see that the standards uh, kind of take and borrow from already established zoning districts within Bloomington. So none of this should, hopefully none of this seems foreign or um, unexpected. It actually borrows heavily from those districts. So the it kind of relies on that success. And we uh, uh, worked off of the 
district use table um, for the um, for the I three district, and uh, we modified some of the uses, or we modified that list of uses by adding or uh, modifying the uses themselves, some of those existing uses, or if we added a use, um, we also modified it in, in a specific nature by including use specific standards. Or we re removed some uses that just conflict with the vision established by the retrofit plan. So, um, you know, car washes, firing range, self storage, some of those uses just um, staff felt weren't appropriate with this new zoning district. And so some of, uh, some of them were removed. Uh, we also considered uh, some of the site and building design standards. Uh, we have uh, struck, uh, setbacks being considered, uh, where parking is considered, again, trying to uh, carry out or trying to establish the vision established in the retro or described in the retrofit plan, and that means a more urban, walkable, uh, or pedestrian-friendly uh, character. And, you know, where parking is considered, it, it lends itself to establishing that, that character. Um, we also considered street, in, street enclosure, which can be described as, like, the amount of, of of a building that actually comes up to the sidewalk so that it creates that enclosure effect with you know not uh, um, you know staying away from a canyon effect that you might see from tall buildings that crowd a street um, this is a good example of pre of you know this, uh, the form that we could see um, with the uh, this new zoning district again you see the building pushed up to the sidewalk, you see transparency on the ground floor, you see thoughtful use of those um, spaces between the road and the building, so that little uh, corner courtyard with uh, seating, and all the parking is to the back. So this is kind of reflective of the character that you might see on uh, with this new zoning district. Um, and uh, something that we also consider were drive-throughs. Uh, we, um, there, we, um, it's, it's recommended to allow drive-throughs, but also just um, maintain their location to the, to the back of buildings, allowing buildings to come up to the sidewalk to uh, allow active uses uh, be, um, be viewable by pedestrians along Lindale. Some other buildings that are reflective of the building forms that you could see with this zoning district are you know, the Bank of America at 98th and, or within the 98th Lindale area. So again, you can see with that image on the right that uh, there's a green space between the sidewalk and the building. It's not set uh, too far back and there's transparency, uh, ground floor transparency that lends to that active feeling that the, the building uh, communicates. Uh, another example is di district apartments um, at 1801 West 80th and Half Street. Um, Multi-story building, transparency on the ground floor coming up to the sidewalk, and uh, residential. So that's also something to consider. Uh, third example is the Marriott Hotel. Um, again, just reflective of those standards, up to the sidewalk, transparency, um, uh, multi-story building, uh, thoughtful use of uh, composition to break up the massing so it doesn't feel uh, such a like a heavy presence along the street so that's another standard we're considering um, as was mentioned before the area is guided industrial and an unrelated uh, retail and residential is not allowed per the comp plan so the comp plan would need to be uh, amended and just to let you know staff has reached out to the uh, Metropolitan Council on those amendments and we're working with them to you know uh, to make sure that we get their approval and that they don't violate uh, any uh, sort of regulation that we're subject to and uh, we'll be presenting those uh, amendments uh, at a later council date so um, since we're dealing with specific parcels in mind for this new district uh, they will need to be rezoned and just to remind you that council has the authority to initiate that rezoning. Uh, it doesn't obligate the council to, to rezone, just to start the process, the public hearing process for that rezoning. So there's a motion below for you to consider um, should you, uh, you know, or if you're supportive of this new zoning district. Um, this is kind of uh, running through the process and the next steps. Uh, we've already had a, a study session with the Planning Commission that was on October 27th. Um, the only thing that really came out of it was, I mean, there was strong support from uh, the uh, Planning Commission members, but uh, they did recommend a small boundary change to include uh, uh, three extra parcels on the north end um, for, uh, there was a towing service at 
uh, Lindale and Harriet that we also included in the area. Uh, next steps will be, um, assuming all goes well tonight, uh, I mean, we'll be incorporating your feedback and then we'll be preparing the ordinance and, and uh, hopefully you'll see that feedback reflected in our draft. And then we'll be scheduling public hearings and we assume those to be about you know, January, February of next year. Some, uh, you know, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of information in your packet, so just here's some questions to kind of stimulate discussion. Uh, under, you know, the broad heading of uses, it, did staff identify the appropriate mix? Um, do you see any issues with what was added, removed, or considered to be modified? Um, for site design, there's a lot of standards for site design and building design, um, setbacks, enclosure, transparency, um, you know, building form standards. Uh, do you have any recommendations uh, for for those aspects? And, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate that feedback. And overall, does the district advance the vision established in the Lindale Avenue Suburban Retrofit Plan? So that's... We just want to make sure that we're hitting that marker at the very least. Um, otherwise, all that other stuff uh, would be very helpful nonetheless to get your input. And uh, I guess with that, I have other slides, you know, just to feed the conversation if we need to. But, uh, yeah, with that, I guess we can we can start from there. Well, thank you, Mr. Ramiller Olson. Um, so the since we're talking the transitional zone here, and I appreciate the the setbacks, the see-through, the drive lanes and, you know, drive-throughs and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we have talked about pretty extensively in transitional zones is noise. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you considered that at all or if there was any discussion about how we deal with that as an issue that uh, could ultimately affect, if we're talking residential, the livability of, of the area um, or just, just the ability to make it a, a place where people want to be. That's a that's a great uh, question, Mayor. Uh, yeah, we did consider those potential land use conflicts that come from uh, industrial heavy in, or heavy business manufacturing uses that are already present in the area, and introducing a, a new, and trying to set a new tone, but also being sensitive to those existing businesses. Right now, there is a 100-foot setback for um, industrial uses from uh, residential uses, or from, uh, sorry, industrial buildings from lots that hold, that are, accommodate residential uses. So we'll, um, we think we've identified a good mix that will um, lessen that conflict. So for instance, we've removed, removed some uses. Um, Something that'll need to be considered is just the amount of traffic that just goes on Lindale. It's it's naturally a very busy corridor, but there are um, there are uh, some models that we can follow. I mean, it it, it doesn't necessarily conflict with uh, residential. Um, we've seen it uh, with other uh, residential developments on Lindale uh, that um, just south of it. I, Glenn, do you remember the? There was Oxborough Heights, but that hasn't been built yet, but there was the other one. Lindale, Lindale Flats. I apologize. Thank you for the assist. Um, yes, yeah, so Lindale Flats is already a residential building on Lindale. And it's uh, and so that's there, there's already proof of concept that Lin, uh, you know residential could exist. However, being in the thick of it, yeah, there are some potential for conflicts. We're still working out how those setbacks could be you know, if they are um, worth being considered as part of this new district to have um, either something modified from that 100 feet that it's expected from industrial uses in relation to residential or maybe shortening it, but also incorporating some other buffering and some other techniques that could, again, lessen those conflicts between those uses. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important point. I mean, I... I spoke specifically of noise, but I think you're right. How do you lessen the conflicts that, that are inherently going to be there, whether it's traffic noise or industrial noise or the noise of a firing range or whatever, you know, there might be, um, or the, you know, just, just what comes with being in a buffer zone between, you know, a busy street and an industrial area, whether, you know, even if it is light industrial. So definitely something to keep in mind, I think. 
Councilmember Lohman. Uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentation. So first, I'll start off by saying I agree with the uh, the uh, vision of the retrofit. Um, I also agree with, with the mayor. Um, I, I'm very concerned about the the conflicts uh, that we're going to create by by doing this. Uh, this you know we have vision. We're going to create conflicts, noise, lighting, traffic. You know whatever you want to add to that. Um, uh, I just think we're going to create future problems. And so one, one of the questions I asked myself as I looked at this is to had staff considered, you know, it sounds like 31 uh, lots here. Love the discussion that the uh, planning commission had. I thought that was there and very uh, um, pertinent to what we're talking about here. But had staff considered taking the 31 uh, zones and just trying to figure out, I don't know what type of acreage that is, and trying to put those somewhere else. Because what it sounds like, to, what it feels like to me that we're trying to do is we are, are trying to, you know, if we were to, you know, erase Lindale and start all over again, here's what we'd do. And I, and I, I bet if we were going to, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not saying for those folks who have their businesses there, I'm not saying, <laughs> please hear me when I say this, I'm not saying, you know, we're I'm trying to get rid of you. But if we were to have a blank slate, would we put the industrial uh, 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 stuff right there behind that residential and, and that main street? I don't think you would. So that's the question I have, you know, just kind of using the, that, the planner uh, background that I have. So my final point that I'll uh, leave with is that um, I, I'm concerned about those conflicts as it relates to the vision because of the economic image, uh, um, the economic, uh, you know, kind of money that we can gain from those industrial. Uh, so I'm just very concerned with basically taking 31 uh, you know, uh, uh, parcels and just taking those kind of off the, the rolls. Yeah, you might set them up as a transitional zone, but that really is going to impact the, you know, the actual industrial zones if we start putting all of these parameters and things. So I just, I just don't think that's really the way to go. Um, I mean, certainly agree with the, but if there's a way to, uh, I, I think Egan, uh, moved businesses and I, I know that came at a substantial amount of money uh when they did that um and it had this this is not related to industrial uh type stuff but they ended up in order to get the type of setup that they wanted they ended up just saying hey to this business can we move and i don't know where you move them in the city <laughs> but uh, i mean uh but i just I, i'm very concerned about those conflicts from a long-term perspective and uh and uh, in, in terms of trying to create that vision, it's almost as if we're going to have to decide between uh, those, two, those two things, either the economic interest of what we're trying to do or that main street uh, vision that we have there. Um, and so I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I'm very concerned about that. If I, if I may respond, yeah, um, Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, great points. Uh, appreciate the concern about those conflicts. We're still discussing that internally and how do we, you know, if there is model... Uh, ordinances that we can pull from or um, you know something that, that just to keep in, in mind as as this district's being discussed is that this is long term and uh, you mentioned long term but we don't expect a, a, a rapid transition so the businesses that are there they're already being accommodated in some of the re uh, recommendations we've made um, you know we have established uh, we have dates basically uh, tied to some of those uses so that if something was established at the point of adoption it can continue on it's a legal it's a legal use it's not it doesn't suddenly become non-conforming so we make a lot of those um, uh, accommodations for existing buildings there are some uses again that we will remove uh, from the from the use list for this district that you'd find within the i3 district but um, we also add some uses. We're just trying to, again, reflect what the vision was in the retrofit plan. And we expect it to carry out over 20 to 30 years. I mean, this is a very, this is a very, um, there's a long-term plan that's, a, that's, a, that's undergirding this. this I, I appreciate this that history. long, the long-term piece. And I'll just say, say one little, little piece more, if I could, uh, Mayor. Uh, it's, it's the I-3 that will remain is what I'm concerned about. Uh, that that we will eventually, when you get the transition done, I'll look at my back and I'll say, hey, I want that stuff gone. And so I'm just wondering if it just makes sense to just try to find a different place for, for those to be somewhere else in the city, um, you know, and then move forward with the with the with the vision uh, rather than uh, belaboring the the point. I think we see that with the uh, uh, 
with the Penn American area, some of the car dealerships that are there, um, they just they're not congruent with what's going on there long term. Certainly, there's you know, but there's a there's an economic driver there, and so I think there's a value to those. So, where do they fit? So that, that's all I'd say. Okay. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As I look through this um, list of uses, the one thing that I, I I'm open to discussion, not right now necessarily on, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if staff may want to reconsider this is um, warehouse as a permitted use. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I look at some of these uses that are, that would, would become prohibit or prohibited or removed, um, data center, exterior storage, self-storage facilities, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I get why that, those changes are being made and it, it would seem to me, I guess to, to my mind, warehousing is sort of an accessory use to another business, you know, a, a manufacturing or a makerspace or something like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm wondering if we want to consider, you know, a warehouse sort of by itself seems to me to be not necessarily in line sort of with that vision. So um, I, I think that may be something that, that could be reevaluated there. Um, because I, I, I think, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about self-storage facilities, for example, and, and um, we did, as I recall, yeah, I was going to say that they're, they're not, um, they don't, they're not allowed in, in this, in this retrofit area. And so I, I think to me, warehouses, <coughs> excuse me, warehouses kind of fall into a, a sort of a similar category there. So just something for, for staff to consider, I think. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, if, if I can respond to that, uh, Mayor and uh, Council Member Coulter. Uh, glad you pro uh, brought that up. Actually, we, so we've already been contemplating the the structure of the new ordinance, and we've you know since the planning commission meeting. I'm sorry if that did not, if that wasn't properly reflected in the staff report or the exhibits that you you've been uh, you have, but we actually have been considering um, a use specific standard for warehousing. So warehousing, as you said, is it could be the principal use, but it's usually um, tied with uh, more office or even retail front of house uses. And warehousing itself is not a very active use. I mean, it's probably, I, I don't know the amount of employees it has per square foot, but it doesn't lend itself to activity that is advocated in the Lindale Avenue uh, retrofit plan. So with that in mind, uh, staff is considering some standards that would require those those more active uses that are come come with warehousing have those front Lindale, um, either a certain percentage of the building width. We're still working out those standards, but we want those active uses along Lindale. And so warehousing still may work, but it needs to come with those more active uses and locating them along the corridor that's under consideration. So in exhibit three of uh, this document here, where you show the protected and transitional industrial uses, you've got the, uh, the transitional area study area outlined in red and it says specifically reguiding and rezoning considered case by case now that, that considering all the I mean the concerns that have been brought up thus far I mean that gives me some comfort knowing that it isn't necessarily a an absolute if we would uh, you know put this in motion or if we would decide that we want to go this direction mm -hmm. that we would consider them on a case by case basis and and um, I don't know it's a uh, it's not a it's not a perfect solution, but I don't know if there's a, a one-size-fits-all in this either. I think it might be a, a case-by-case kind of thing, especially in an, a, a dense area like this, a, a developed area like this, that we'd be looking at retrofitting and trying to figure out the best ways to make this all work together. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I guess uh, overall, I certainly understand the concerns about things like noise, but I you look at the map and just a, a couple blocks further east, the most intense of these uses are butted right up against small single family homes. Mm -hmm. um, so not to say that, that there is an issue or there, there isn't a noise complaint, but this having this decent stretch of, of transition would certainly be better than what exists over on in areas like Wentworth. I, I, I guess just for thinking moving forward as um, the fruit of the retrofit uh, kind of comes before us and we see more walkability, we see more small independent businesses, uh, folks getting out of their cars and tra traversing the corridor, uh, how we mitigate future conflicts with, say, heavy truck traffic 
uh, that may be utilizing Lindale to get to this core of more intense uses. So that's not specifically speaking to this rezoning, but just um, considering the direction that we're pointed in, um, I'm starting to think about that. And, and also further down the line, whatever final package we land on, I'm also curious what um, learning we're gonna take for this for our other commercial nodes mm -hmm. that may not have heavy industrial use, but that we're gonna try and encourage heavier commercial use. So looking at the Portland Avenue Legacy Project, um, Old Cedar, Old Shakopee, uh, what what can we take from this to say what does a commercial transitional area look like um, for heavier retail, things like that? Because I'm guessing we'll see opportunities come out of stuff like the 494 project uh, and potential business turnover um, based on access changes. So, it, again, not specific to, to this, but whatever package we land on, how cookie cutter can we make the approach since we're going to have to move on a lot of that? Yeah. Council Member D'Alessandro. I'll keep any specific comments to when it comes back again. Um, but I, I just been, I was just kind of curious, what, what, um, what made staff decide that creating a new zone was in, like, was the right best idea in the first place? And I'm, I'm not suggesting I know any better, but I've lived in places where there are no zoning laws, and people just like, you know, and so I'm kind of curious about why our instinct is to go, oh, we should do another zone and like, and where that comes from and inherently, if you can explain that, uh, I, I, maybe it's more of a esoteric question, <laughs> but I'm kind of curious about whether or not there were other items on the table, including don't do anything and let it come up case by case and deal with it then type thing. Uh, Mayor, uh, council member D'Alessandro, uh, thank you for that question. Yeah. The, I mean, the, uh, as, as mentioned at the beginning, so the, uh, there was a work plan established for 2022, and that work plan um, took some of the recommendations that came out of the suburban retrofit plan. And one of and the a key recommendation out of the retrofit plan was to address the zoning conflicts on Lindale that you know again that would butt up against the vision established in that plan. And one of the, and it further detailed that to con create a new zoning district or an overlay district some way to adjust the zoning of those lots that front directly on Lindale so that uh, you know uh, we could transition from what is a heavy industrial nature to something that's less than, and then on the other side, there's more commercial in nature. So creating that transition, it was very important in the suburban retrofit plan, and it identified the, I, the I-3 the lots on, on Lindale, and there's only it's it's only between 86 and 90 seconds so we kind of had the the map made for us we we considered other oh, whoops we considered lots that are a you know a few or uh, that are a little bit to the east of i mean you'll see it at uh 90th and lindale there's some lots that actually kind of go uh further into Lind 90th and then there's halsey lane which isn't directly on Lindale, but again, we consider that all part of the package in order to establish the character that was advocated for in the retrofit plan. So we we took direction from that retrofit plan and we considered the best course of action, staff considered the best course of action was to establish a new zoning district, but um, you know, we're obviously open to any other recommendations or suggestions about how to proceed. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I think related, well, it is related. I do, I believe, and I'm looking at Mr. Markagar because I think he probably has a better memory than me, but I believe council gave direction to staff too to go in that direction mm -hmm. at some point. Like we've had, we had so many conversations about the, about the Lindale Avenue retrofit and the recommendations coming forward. And I, in my mind, I have a distinct memory of actually the council agreeing that we wanted to move forward or to direct staff to explore this option. And so that would also be part of the background. Um, and I guess I would just say it was related to my comment that I was going to make. Um, I'm really excited about this, and I do believe that it aligns with what we discussed in the past in terms of the vision for the corridor and that and needing to have that transitional um, zoning area and so I'm really excited by it and um, I guess I, I had a similar question around the warehouse but the way you explained it makes sense to me so 
So, Council, given the uh, concerns that have been brought forward, and I'm sure they'll take back, and, and the notion that uh, if we would adopt, adopt this resolution to initiate this rezoning action, it, it isn't tying our hands and committing us to doing so. It just kind of initiates the action. Uh, are we comfortable moving forward just to keep the ball rolling on this? Because I, I agree with Councilmember Carter. This is what we talked about. These, these are This is the direction we kind of gave staff to go in. Um, but as I said, I think with some of the the cautions and the caveats that have been brought forward, I think we can continue to move forward with this with that in mind. Would that make sense? Have I convinced anybody to make a motion? <laughs> Councilmember Martin. Mayor, you've convinced me to make a motion. Uh, Councilmember Martin. I will move that we adopt a resolution initiating rezoning action of the parcels included in the project study area for the transitional industrial zoning district project per the recommendations of the Lindale Avenue Suburban Retrofit Plan. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Carter to adopt the resolution initiating the rezoning action of the parcels included. Any further comments, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you. You got enough to move forward on now? Yes. Yes, yes, Mayor. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. <laughs> and our final item this evening is item 5.3, our City Council policy and issue updates. Um, I'll... I'll, I'll because it's is written this way in the agenda, I need to get into the habit of doing this where I'll recap the, uh, the, the listening session first. We heard, uh, we heard from two groups, or two individuals, one individual and one group this evening, uh, Mark Morrow, Kyle Elbert, and who was the third person? Molly. Molly. Doyle. Molly Doyle, thank you very much, who spoke to us this, uh, this evening. They represented the, uh, the Jefferson Athletic Foundation, the Kennedy Activities Fund, and um, just talking about the funding for athletics and activities within the, uh, the Bloomington Public Schools. They talked about uh, the need uh, and the desire to make sure that we invest in both schools and the community, and spoke encouragingly of our school board, the city council joint meetings, and want us to continue that. And we had a good discussion about uh, how unique Bloomington was in terms of uh, the contiguous borders that we have between the school district and the, the city and how we haven't quite cracked the nut as to how to use that as effectively as possible and make that as strong as possible. Uh, but we are working toward it and we did pledge to continue to work with them and work with their school board to try and find the, way, the ways that we could best, uh, best do that moving into the future. We also had a discussion uh, with Ms. Sally Ness again, uh, questions about uh, decisions that were made about a decade or so ago regarding um, Smith Park and, and the park structures at Smith Park and whether or not uh, it was uh, an acceptable use or uh, if, if we should be continuing to, to move forward and discuss this. Um, the only other thing that I would have is I wanted to thank and congratulate our city clerk staff on a, an outstanding once again election day and post-election day here in the city of Bloomington. We had about a 70% turnout here in Bloomington, which was about par for uh, the, the midterm elections or the off-year elections. Uh, so we had a lot of folks who did vote. We had a lot of folks who voted early here in the city of Bloomington. And as I have said and keep saying, they do an outstanding job. And you can always tell because there's just no drama around Bloomington elections, which is exactly how we like it. And they do just outstanding work, not only the city clerk staff, but also the election judges who the clerk staff trains and then turns over election day to them, and they do just fantastic work. And so hats off to you all. Thank you so very much. And thanks to everybody who voted also. Like I said, 70% turnout uh, was pretty good, pretty darn good. So that's all I have. Mr. Verbrugge, anything from your end? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, thank you for acknowledging the good work of our clerk's office and the elections judges. I was going to do that, but you beat me to the punch. Uh, however, election related, I want to acknowledge that council member Coulter has been elected to a new seat in the state legislature, and uh, that will uh, necessitate a process for the city to follow based on the charter uh, once a vacancy is created on the council. Uh, so according to the charter, the council has 45 days to fill the seat once it is vacated. 
And uh, when the council comes to the point of voting on a, uh, an appointment, uh, they have, you have three chances to um, pa agree on somebody. And if the council cannot uh, come to a conclusion, then it is the mayor's appointment after that. So uh, if there's a three to three deadlock, for example, since there would only be six members voting. Um, so we have uh, had this experience a couple times in the past seven years. Uh, and so um, the, the process has worked fairly well. We'll come back to the council either next week or the following week uh, to lay out some recommendations for uh, declaring uh, the impending vacancy and um, announcing the process for soliciting interest if uh, there are persons in the community who wish to be considered by the city council uh, for appointment to the vacant seat. Uh, and it's good for folks to know that according to our charter, uh, if somebody is, well, whomever is um, appointed, to that seat will have to stand for election uh, at the at the next city election, and so um, there's uh, you know there's a little bit of work that would have to be done by somebody appointed to the seat if they wish to retain it um, by election. So uh, we'll come back to you in the next uh, meeting or two and lay out uh, more information and some suggestions about how we proceed uh, in filling that vacancy. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Any questions of Mr. Verbrugge on that? Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick question of clarification. The election would be, uh, that would be a special election at the next regular election next fall for the remaining two years of the term. So the appointment would be less than a year and then you'd run for the remaining two years. That's correct. The, the special election would be for the balance of the term that's remaining. And I don't know why. I, right. I know exactly why I know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Coulter, did you have a question? Um, not a question. I just, um, <coughs> Mr. Ruby stole a lot of what I was going to say, but um, just for the public's awareness, my plan is to serve through our final meeting of the year, which is December 19th, I believe. Um, and... I have to resign before I'm sworn into the House of Representatives on January 3rd. Um, we're still, I think, I'm, I always get a little bit nervous when I ask the legal department to look into something and it takes them a long time to get an answer back to me. Um, so we're, we're, still working, <laughs> we're, we're still working on the details there, but um, I, I will resign sometime between um, our meeting on the 19th and, and January 3rd, and then that's when the clock starts for that that 45 day process so and congratulations i apologize for not saying that earlier so well done congratulations council anything else this evening council member loman uh just two real quick things uh so with respect to the expo uh thing that we heard earlier I, i'm curious if there's a way to uh either through zoning or some other policy uh, kind of lock that zone down to kind of accomplish that idea of uh, that zero waste concept uh, that they talked about um, uh, for the expo uh, piece um, or, the, or just that sustainability piece. We can talk a little bit more about that in detail in terms of what I mean uh, later on. I know we're getting late here in the, in the hour here. And then the other thing I'd be curious about is if there's any updates with respect to artistry uh, since the public, we haven't been together, uh, that, that either the manager would want to share um, that can, can be shared. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, to the second question about artistry, uh, you may have seen they did send out a communication to uh, community members at the end of last week just with an update of uh, where they're at currently. Uh, the Board of Directors has uh, a meeting scheduled for next week. Uh, they are continuing to seek out um, uh, funders and funding opportunity and uh, are doing so with the intent of, of trying to preserve the organization and, and continue as a going concern. Uh, so as I expect the board will learn more about that next week. And uh, in the communication that they put out to the community last week, they also indicated that they would, uh, that they would have a follow-up communication by the end of this month. Regarding the expo, uh, I would 
um, be curious to hear what your thought process is in terms of the the um, sustainability components uh, and the and the zoning code itself. I I think there's probably a little bit more. I think there's a little more research that needs to be done, sure. but I, 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 it's more aspirational than I uh, than I have any structure to it. But I want to just put it out there now that uh, I, you know I. I it, with the water park and other things that we kind of work from behind the scenes. So it'd be nice to have something established and then we could swim towards that. So, um, uh, we could talk about that at another point in time. And, and council member Loman, did you intend to say we'll swim towards that referring water to the water yeah. park? No, we did. That sounds <laughs> clever. Council member D'Alessandro. Very quickly, Mr. Mayor. Um, just wanted to let the public know, anybody who's still listening anyway, that um, our friends at the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce are hosting uh, a budget town talk on Thursday right here in Council Chambers at 8 in the morning. I think, uh, is that right, 8? Yes. Uh, Mike Sable and, and Kari Carlson will host that. It's open to the public and there's no charge. So it's just a nice thing in case you still have questions about the budget or you want to hear a little bit more directly from those folks about it, um, I would encourage people to come to that if they're able to as well, especially any of our small business folks since we were talking about small business earlier today. So, we were indeed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else, Council? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, Council, for your work tonight. Thanks to the staff. Thanks to the members of the public who are here and everybody watching. Have a great evening.